Okay, it is six o'clock. I will call this meeting to order. And the first thing I'd like to do is read our little meeting statement for live meeting uh, protocols. So please be aware that this live council meeting is being recorded. Your personal information, including your image, voice, name, opinions, and any other personal information disclosed by you during the meeting is collected by the City of Roslyn under the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act for the purpose of your participation in public input. If you have any questions about the collection of your personal information, please contact dco at roslyn.ca. If you do not wish your personal information to be collected, please do not join this live council meeting. In order to run the public input period smoothly, if you wish to comment on an agenda item, please use the raise your hand button there on your computer. I will call on those who wish to speak by name. When your name is called, please unmute your microphone, state your name and comments. Thank you. So with that, uh, we're going to start with public input. So is there anyone there who would like to speak to public input? Anise, are you there? Hello. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Welcome, Anise. Thanks for coming to our meeting. Hi, my name is Anise Basley, and I'm 11 years old, and I live in Rosland. I believe that it's a good idea to paint the big gray retaining wall just beyond the miners' hall because it is very boring. The painting could represent our city. We could gather a group of artists or volunteers to paint the wall with a paint, a special paint or a stain, so then it wouldn't wear off. I could help raise some of the money for the supplies. Would the city support, coordinate, and contribute to the money? Thank you for talk. Thank you for listening to me. Okay, thanks. Anise, I have another question for you. Um, do you want to stay and listen to our discussion of this item? Yes. Okay, then I, I'm going to move it forward on the agenda. Okay. Okay, is there anyone else for public input that would like to speak? You can raise your little hand there if you wish. Okay, I'm seeing, I'm seeing no one. Okay, so we will adopt the amendment, the agenda where we're gonna move item 9A, which is a mural on Highway 3B, to item 6A, and 8A, the cannabis license application, to item 6B. Okay, we'll take a mover. Dirk moves it, Janice seconds it, all in favor? Okay, okay. Uh, so now we have our registered petition and delegation. So I see we have, looks like Kevin and David are there. So you guys, take it away. You're muted. David, I can't hear you. go. That's better. How's that now? Much better. Thank you. Welcome. Right. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for uh, for having us today. Uh, my name is David Parker and I'm the director of uh, 09031411 BC Limited, also known as The Applicant. And uh, thanks again for the city for postponing uh, the discussion until this meeting. And so uh, myself and Kevin Durden, um, will be uh, providing some information that we think supports our um, application. So um, now a month has passed, so I've read both uh, through both the May 14th report as well as the June 10th report, and I see some changes there. I was wondering if you could please speak to what those changes are. What specifically are you, are you referring to? Well, I was just wondering, there, was, there seemed to be some additions and I just was wanting some clarification basically on what those additions were. What was the differences between last month's report and this month's report? Well, that's an excellent question. Stacy. do you want to address that? I thought we just added some other, uh, some other input from people, but I don't know if there was actually much significant in the report itself. No, not, not a lot significant, I'm trying to think. 
want to add some clarification because council had asked about the BC liquor store and why the one was approved. Um, and then I added the additional comments and emails that I had received since the last one. And then I added some more clarification on the feedback and why it was required at the end. All right, thank you. Um, all right, so what we'll, uh, I'll address uh, at the beginning and then Kevin will take over near the end was uh, just, the, just to rehash and go over the, uh, the situation as it is. Uh, location of the proposed store um, uh, based on the requirements of the city, uh, the Mountain Pineapple meets all location requirements. Um, and there was, uh, as it speaks to within the report, that there was no limitations uh, placed on the number of licenses that could be issued and no specific distances uh, between competing businesses. Uh, one of the points within the report uh, talks about it is difficult to identify any benefits to the community or commercial neighbors from clustering cannabis stores on the same block. And this is, I think, uh, a bit unfounded, uh, and I'll use the example of um, an auto mall, which are popular throughout many urban areas, and it provides uh, more choice uh, to the consumer. And it is, studies have shown how um, by putting all the car dealers together, it actually it forces, it drives sales up. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, one of the other component, uh, situations here was that uh, our point number two, general impact on the community if the application is approved. And I was wanting to point out uh, the one position here within that statement is that there is no clear benefit and need for another store. And also I, I take issue with that. Uh, competition within the space provides the benefit. Uh, the benefit is a better retail experience um, for the consumer. Um, and the way stores who are in competition with each other can differentiate themselves from each other is, is providing knowledgeable staff and accept, exceptional customer service. So I think what um, limiting Rosalind to just one store does not really... Um, provide that impetus. It doesn't really drive that forward. It doesn't provide a great retail experience for people. It limits their choice and uh, therefore I think it does the uh, market a disservice. Keeping one store and you know I noticed that I've read through the comments from the consumers and the summary of, uh, of the concerns expressed is that it sounds like there's a lot of folks who really want to protect the existing business but protectionism does not support an open market. And it does, it, it, it does provide uh, less options to the consumer and it puts less pressure on the black market. Um, and just to, you know, to point out that the, um, the respondents of 27, 27 respondents is less than 1% of the population of, of the city of Roslyn. Whereas if I would draw your attention to the city report from May 9th, 2018, there was 503 respondents uh, to the uh, city of Roslyn survey results legalization of recreational cannabis, of which 326 of 503 or 64.8% were in favor of having two or more stores. So, that's a very strong indicator, and I think a much better representative sample of the population's wishes. I just want to point that out as well. Um, now another issue that I'd like to point out is that, yes, well, I'd already covered that just a second. I wanted to get my page it, it, back. Again. David, let me interrupt you. We, we have read the report. If, if, if you want to add something of your own other than things that we've, we've already read, that would be probably more better use of your time. Uh, well, I just wanted to point out the obvious, though, is that you had 503 respondents in, in, uh, in 2018, 
which is a much better and larger representative sample of the taxpayers of Roslyn. Would That's you agree right. with that? We've read our, our report for sure. Okay. All right. Now, with respect to the black market, the report does seem to have a, a, a support uh, and a tacit acceptance of the black market, but the black market is, is you know, doing that is, it, is expressly at cross purposes to both the mandates of the federal and provincial governments. And the, um, you know, the reason, uh, let me just get to the right page here. The purpose of the Cannabis Act is to prevent youth from accessing cannabis. We can all agree upon that. And it's to displace the illegal cannabis market, which keeps the profit uh, out of the pockets of criminals. And it also is to protect the public health and safety by allowing adults access to legal cannabis. So having only one licensed store within the town helps to actually encourage proliferation of the black market. And I think that's at, definitely at cross purposes to the intent of the Cannabis Act. Uh, and with that, I was going to turn it over now to Kevin. Kevin Dearden, uh, the store manager uh, for the Green Pineapple in Warfield, okay. as he will address the, uh, some of the issues with respect to the product and the markets and uh, the market share and, and, and more to that like. Okay. Kevin, are you there? Yeah, I am. Thank you, David. Kevin, you're on. Perfect. Uh, firstly, thank you for your time and your consideration with this matter. Uh, I guess for me, uh, my standpoint is that I'm going to try to show that uh, there is room for two uh, legal cannabis stores in Rosland. Um, and I'm going to show it from a retail standpoint. Uh, so I guess I, I did provide a spreadsheet um, and on, I don't know if everyone has it, but on uh, page six, slide six, a number of local stores. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, we do have it. Perfect, perfect. So basically what I wanted to illustrate here is how strong the cannabis market is within the Kootenai region. And as we will see, like in Castlegar, we currently have seven stores. Now, if you look at the population of 8,040, uh, each store has an uh, overall population market share of 1,148. 1, uh, 1, now, I won't go over all of it because I know you have it in front of your face, but what I will point out is the average local, the average sto local store overall population market share is 2,000. Now, that's if you include Rosalind. Now, if we take Rosalind out, that number drops down to 1,470 for average population per store, average uh, customers per store. If there was two stores in Rosalind, we would still benefit from a population share of 1,800 people per store, which is above the average in the Kootenai region. Uh, as we've seen within the Kootenays, we're still seeing stores pop up in your places like your Castle Bar and Trail. And this is because this growing market is forever expanding. Uh, we are constantly seeing new products added to the market which is only helping each, every store increase sales. After uh, local stores, what I'd like to point out in the next page is product selection. In regards to product selection, um, it was put forward that uh, in the report that given that they are selling the same product from the provincial government at nearly identical price points, there is no clear benefit and need for another store. Now I'd like to ensure council that uh, this is far from the case. Uh, as this is an emergent industry, there are many different retail strategies you could take, whether it be you're focusing on customer service, price, convenience, or product selection. Um, and there's many different product categories to choose from, whether it be flour, extracts, edibles, or topicals. And also the CBD market is getting uh, quite large uh, recently as well. Uh, so I'll just BC Cannabis stores currently hold uh, 1,793 products in their catalog. Now we at Warfield, we have quite a large inventory um, and we only hold 22% of that. So what I would suggest is there's plenty of room for multiple stores to hold different inventories in the same area. Uh, and then when it comes down to pricing, uh, it would probably relate to that very similar. Uh, I guess our, our strategy is not solely based on price. Uh, we like to offer full service, which includes uh, 40 smell jars. Uh, we've got our own personalized uh, display cards in store, and we pride ourselves on giving friendly, uh, informative service. So people spend a little bit more time with us. And we believe that that's, that model would work really well in uh, Rosalind's tourism in industry and help prop up that. 
besides that, I don't really have too much else to say. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any. And I'd like to pass it back to Dave to quickly finalize. Thank you, Kevin. Um, yeah, there's not much else to ask uh, or to, to mention here with respect to this. I think it's, it's clear. We believe there's room for another retailer in the area. Um, we believe that the council should be giving more credence to the uh, over 500 people that responded uh, with respect to the, um, the uh, survey from uh, 2018. Uh, 13 and a half percent is a much larger representative sample than less than 1%. So I think that, uh, I think that that really should hold some weight. And again, I would like to summarize by saying that uh, having a strong retail sector of licensed cannabis vendors will put pressure on the black market and um, we won't make it go away but we'll give the consumers uh, a much better choice and a much more comfortable environment to, uh, to shop in. And I, I, just, I just don't understand why we would not be in, why would you would not be in favor of letting the market work itself out. The free market will determine on who, who lives and who dies, who is successful and who is not. We have an excellent store model that we're running in Warfield. We have, I don't know if you've been to our store and seen what it looks like and met Kevin, very professional manager, very knowledgeable. Uh, we pride ourselves on that. And that's the image. That's the model we want to bring to Roslyn. With that. Uh, Council, uh, does anyone have any questions? Question Janice. Thank you very much for your presentation, gentlemen. I, uh, I was very happy to receive that information about the industry and to uh, learn a bit more about it to help uh, inform my decision. I did have a couple of questions. Um, I don't know if you're aware, but Warren forwarded some additional information to us this afternoon in a point, uh, in a point form. Did he also send that to you? One of the, uh, really the only question I have about it is that he indicated uh, at the end that the current value of a non-medical retail uh, cannabis license is between 400,000 and 1.2 million. Is that sort of the ballpark of the investments that you'll be making um, if this uh, license is approved, if, this, if you get through all the steps and open the uh, store up here? It's, it's, a rep, it's an accurate representative sample, I think, of what the value is of a license uh, in a particular market. Um, whether that would equate to what our investments would be, I can't say for certain. I'd have to defer to, to Warren on that. Um, but it's, uh, you know, the licenses have value. Uh, it's like a, uh, use an example, would be a, uh, a liquor store license uh, has a value to it. Uh, I come from a farm background and we would use the same analogy with a chicken quota or a, a dairy quota. They provide, they have a value to them uh, moving forward. I don't know if that answers your question properly, Janice, but. Good. Close enough. Thank you. Uh, the only other thing I wanted to ask is if there are any other, uh, do you have any other uh, individuals locally that are involved in your um, enterprise? Other than yourself, Kevin and uh, Warren. Uh, yeah, there's another partner in the business, Jody, we met. Okay, good to know. Downtown yeah, I know, Jody, thank you very much. Uh, again, I really appreciate you pulling that information together for us. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions? Okay, uh, yes, Chris. You're muted. Chris, you're muted. And I'm going to unmute, lower my hand, all the things I got to do before I talk. Um, two questions. Um, so you talk about the market share and the overall population of people versus stores. Um, was that, is that all people or um, people that are illegally allowed to buy cannabis? It, it is all people. Um, so basically going up the full population there. It's very, like, obviously there are people under the age of 19. Um, However, getting, uh, getting the, even the breakdown of consumer use is very hard because uh, it's such a new market to actually determine what the consumer use is. Um, so a lot of times uh, when it comes to looking into new locations, we can really go off the full populace and we just use that as our breakdown. Um, pretty much the magic number is 1500. If you can achieve that, 
you know your store's going to do okay. Um, yes, you could definitely break down into a, a little bit more, uh, break down the levels using cannabis consumption. But as I mentioned, those stats are just so all over the place with different websites and different uh, people getting those stats. So it's very hard to tell where the market is right now. And it's forever grow growing as well. A lot of cannabis users aren't really our market. Um, we have a lot of people using it for medical use, even though we are recreational, they'll still come in for the, the creams and all that kind of stuff. And that's also a very hard market to determine where that's at. Um, but yes, to answer your question, it does include people under 19. Uh, it is using the whole, uh, the whole population. But that number is across the board with any place that we use. Yeah, probably used, be more um, hold on one second, Chris. Probably would be more yeah. helpful and it's not that hard to get adult demographics if you just use the adult, adult one. Just, I mean, it doesn't matter. You're using the same for everyone here, but just a little more informative than, than counting all the children. So go ahead, Chris. I, I could provide that for you if you'd like. I'm more than happy to get those numbers. They're very, I'm sure they'll be very similar, um, similar numbers uh, when, it, when it comes to the breakdown, but I'd be more than happy to provide that if you'd like. Okay, and then David mentioned uh, um, a comparison to an auto mall. Was that you? Sorry, Kevin. Um, that was that was me. I think that was David. Thank you. Uh, I think on an average of two cars per household. Um, I don't know if that number is working the same as the, the marijuana users in the area. Just throwing it out there to use that as, as an example. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think if there were like one car in every five households, I don't know if auto malls would be, would be existing today. Just saying. I don't know if that's, that's the... it. I don't know if cannabis use would uh, be one, only like one car per se. I think we're going to uh, start to see a lot more uh, cannabis use in the industry. As I mentioned with the topicals, uh, with vaporizers just coming out, edibles just coming out, it's really opening up the market. Um, so we're starting to see people that never used to use cannabis starting to use it. So we will see this expand. Right. Um, but yes, I do get your, your point to that. But if you look at Castlegar, uh, they've got seven stores up there and they're doing quite well. That market's quite strong up there. And a lot of consumers will just go straight to Castlegar because you've got the options. Why go to a place with one store when you can go to Castlegar and have multiple options? Yeah, I, I had a question about that. I'm, 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 I am not familiar with all the retailers that you mentioned and, and the stores, but I am concerned because this is a new industry sort of just getting started in the, in the legal realm. Um, you know, there's, I'm guessing there'll be some shakeout. I don't know how long those seven stores, for instance, in Castlegar are in place and if all seven will be able to survive. Um, so I'm, I'm curious about that. When you look at the numbers of those, um, can you tell me anything about how long those stores have been established? I, I would I definitely agree with you. A lot, of them are, uh, a lot of them are new from this year and they're still popping up. So there's still, uh, there's still business uh, owners that want to go into that market and for good reason, because there is, there is room there. Even though it might look tight, there is room there for, uh, for a store to succeed. Now, will all stores, uh, will all stores stay around? Probably not. But I, I would attain that to a, a lot of just bad running of stores as well. There's a lot of places that aren't uh, doing things so much correctly. Um, like we do have some amazing stores in this area, but some are just uh, looking for making a quick buck as well. And how, how well will they go? Who knows? But everyone has their own model. And to, to understand which model is going to work, none of us know. You know, our model may not be the best model. We think it's working for us. Other people's models may, uh, they, they're obviously choosing it for a reason. So we don't know what model's going to earth the truth. Uh, we do know this market's growing and it's constantly growing. Our product catalog is very, very small compared to what it's going to be. And we're going to start to see a lot more users using the less dry cannabis and a lot more for the other reasons for cannabis. So, uh, it is a tough one to say, right? that's to be honest. Okay, great. I just had one other question and this also shows my ignorance on your pricing chart there are all of those stores that you mentioned, you mentioned green pineapple. And are all the rest of them in, in our area or are they elsewhere? Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, they, they are all in the local area, those stores. Um, I just got a breakdown of like, I try to pick some products that we all have. It, that was quite hard because um, it does differ. Um, but I did, I did pick some that we've managed to all have. And you can see that the price point does vary depending on the styles of stores. You know, some stores don't really have too much uh, to see when you go in. It's just a menu. You go in and you pick it. So uh, their prices are usually a little bit lower. Um, but they may not bring in the... Uh, you know, the window shoppers per se. I guess it's not window shopping, but you know what I mean. Yeah, okay. Okay, well, if council has no other questions, I don't see anybody raising their little blue hand there. Um, thank you, gentlemen, for your presentation. We're gonna move on to our other discussion about the wall while Anise is here, and then we'll get back to you, okay? So, thank, thank you. you. Thank you.
Okay, so Council, we are moving to page 176 of the agenda, and that is the request to implement a mural on the concrete wall on Highway 3B that Anise spoke to us about. Um, the staff recommendation is that we provide further direction. So does Council have any further direction that we would like to provide? Dirk, unmute yourself and speak to us. Yeah, I... I... I was concerned, I think, as Modi pointed out, that uh, they'd be quite disruptive to traffic. It's quite narrow and there are a lot of trucks if, while painting it on. Wondered if there was an opportunity to do something similar to the one they put at the, at the library, by the Cenotaph, where it was uh, pre-painted and then fixed to the wall. It'd be a lot less disruptive and easier to maintain for in the winter, snow, that kind of thing. I like the color. The idea um, seems a bit disruptive. Okay, so you would make a motion to direct staff to do some further investigation about how this could actually happen? Is that because we don't, we don't know the answer to that question? Yeah, sure. Okay, do we have a seconder for that? Okay, Chris seconds it. Um, okay, so any further discussion about that? Because we're going to ask staff to look into it further, so you might want to give a little more so a few more suggestions. I'll start with Dirk and go to Chris since they moved it and then everybody else can jump in. Um, if we want to uh, have part of this motion be other further direction to staff about what we want them actually to do. Yeah. I, I, removable, uh, removable thing is one. Yeah, I, I just think it's, I think it's great that we have somebody that's 11 years old interested in making the town a nicer place that should be supported. I think it should be supported in a safer uh, more, not editable, but a safer and, um, I don't even know the word I'm trying to use, safer way. How's that? Well, traffic, traffic control is something that people do very well. You know, you can, if, if it was somebody up there painting for a period of time, they could do it in the middle of the night when there's very little traffic and put some lights out or something. But maybe we want sure. staff to look into some, some cost and sort of what it, what it would take. Modi had said that they'd, they'd need to be involved if we wanted to explore it further too. So there'd be a, a staff conversation with them. Um, okay, Chris, you were next. Yeah, I think that uh, Dirk, your, your suggestion of, of something attached to the wall is excellent. And I would, uh, you know, Denise, I'm, I really appreciate your thoughts and ideas here. And I'm really, I'm an art lover at heart. And uh, I, I'm toiling with, uh, with trying to make this work. But I think that, uh, that Dirk's suggestion is excellent. Thank you. Okay, Stuart, you had your hand up next, I think. Yeah, I'm a little conflicted on this one because I, I don't know what the community thinks on this. I mean, I, I see random art going up in sort of un, you know, unconventional places and it gets a pretty mixed response. So, I, I, you know, I, it's, it's a suggestion. I don't know if it's a good one. I don't know if that's the right place or what people actually want to see. So, um, I guess I'd like to, rather than just because somebody suggests, suggests just doesn't mean it's a good idea. I'd perhaps like to put it out and see if this is something that people are excited about and want to see, not just, yeah, someone suggested it, so therefore we should do it. Um, well, I don't you know, think I can tell you what I think personally. I, I, I like things, I, you know, I mean, I can tell you what I think about it, but you know, if, 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 if the community thinks it's a great idea, then I'm, then I'll go with it. But I don't know that. I think the first thing we're looking at is to see what would it entail from Ministry of Transportation and, and city staff point of view. And then at that, the next thing would be to then, you know, have some public engagement on it and see and see and then, you know, figure out how we want to go about even figuring out the artwork itself. I mean, I think you're, you're talking about something farther down the line than what this motion is considering right now. Um, Andy, you were next. Uh, uh, so we can I, can I just ask, so we're, we're, we're just providing direction about assessing the feasibility of it. Is that all we're doing? Yes. Or are we providing direction whether we should actually do it or not? No, we need to know whether it's feasible before we can decide whether we want to do it or not, right? We got, we got to see what, what okay. comes back. I mean, you know, Ministry of Transportation can come back and say, absolutely, sure, it's great, $200,000. And then we'll say, whoops, they, you know, not feasible. I mean, there's a lot of things between, between a pretty painting on the wall and us you know, having some conversation about looking into it. So this is like step one. Okay, Andy. I, I would agree that 
we should go ahead and, and explore, uh, continue to explore it. Uh, and I like a combination of, of what Dirk was saying and Stu, I think as well, um, in having a broader community uh, vision towards something like this. It's gonna be a substantial uh, mural is my guess. And I think we've got a wonderful arts community in, our, in, in Rosalind and I would like to see everybody in that community um, have some input into what that could look like. Uh, it could be it could be an opportunity to bring our arts community together to do a, a community project. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think as, if I understand the motion correctly, it's to direct staff to liaise with the uh, Minister of Transportation to see if it's feasible and particularly focus on is it feasible to do it as a panel that's prepared elsewhere and then installed. And then with, we talk about, you know, cost and public engagement and everything a bit, a bit later. We need those basics first and then get down to the more detailed part. Is that, is that pretty much what you guys had in mind, you motion makers? Yeah, okay. Janice, did you want to comment or are you just riding? I, I'm, I'm very happy to listen to the discussion. I'm very um, impressed that Anise has brought this forward and uh, feel strongly about it. And, uh, and I think it's a good enough idea to explore some more options and see if it is a possibility. Okay, that's great. Stuart, you still have your hand up. Do you, are, do you want to speak again before I call the question? No, I just need to take my hand down. Okay, that's good. Sorry. All right. Okay, I'll call the question on this. This is just to uh, get, find some more information from Minister of Transportation and come back to us. All in favor? Okay, anyone opposed? Okay, that carries. Thank you, Anise. Thank you very much for coming and speaking to us about this. So, You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. All right. You're welcome to stay to the meeting, but probably won't be nearly as interesting as the part you just heard. Uh, okay. So now we are going to consider the cannabis retail store license application for 2185 Columbia. That's on page 75 of your agenda. Staff recommendation is that we have, I'm not going to read the whole thing, basically that it not be approved for the, out, for the reasons outlined in the staff report. Do we have a mover for that motion or a different motion? Uh, Dirk, you're muted. Uh, I, I will move it for that motion and I can explain why after. In okay, the discussion. do we have a seconder? Get this on the table. Okay, Chris seconds it. All right, Dirk, go ahead. I think, I, I mean, I'm not, I've looked through a number of things and I'm not convinced that uh, more shops means uh, less uh, illegal marijuana. I think that is a pricing factor. The number of people, I know a few in town that have, that in, partake in marijuana and most of them buy on the black market because it's cheaper. So I don't, I don't see more shops being a, a significant change. Uh, when we went through this, and, and I indicated this to Warren, that we were asked by the province to judge this essentially on four criteria, and those are uh, if the community has regulated access to non-medical cannabis, and it, it does more so than pretty much anywhere else in the province. Um, we, have, we have a shop here, a shop in Warfield, a 15-minute drive, and you can cover six shops, and plus online sales. And uh, so I think that we have the access. Uh, the community response and the views. I, I don't think that the survey that was done before legalization is terribly representative of what it really looks like on the ground. So I, I think that the views that we've heard from people have been um, on, on balance opposed and I think kind of more in place for that. Um, the, if the region is sufficiently served, so I think as Kevin has pointed out, uh, we're absolutely sufficiently um, served by, you know, our, the BC average is one for every 19,000 people. That's the, the BC average for pot shop densities. And in Vancouver, it's one for 86,000 people. So I think that even at one for 3,000 people, um, we're extremely well served. And then uh, the one, the proposed location, I, uh, this comes down to a bit more subjective, but uh, I mean, I wouldn't want to see a bike shop going in next to a bike shop or a cannabis shop going in next to a cannabis shop. So I just, I thought the, the proximity, I don't know, didn't tip any balances, but we were asked to consider that and I didn't think that it was great. So those are my, those are my reasons. Okay, thanks. Uh, Chris, you second it. 
Uh, thanks, Dirk. Yeah, very similar to Dirk. The lack of data available for securing uh, uh, um, that our escape costs can create both stores, it's, it's kind of vague. Um, You're breaking the, up, Chris. Sorry, is that I, I couldn't. I couldn't hear what you said. I don't know if everybody else could, but you were breaking up. Okay. Hold on, I'm going to switch to... Uh, Now you're frozen. Can you hear us? Oh, we lost Chris. Somebody else want to speak there while Chris is he's getting back. Oh, he's back. All right. Yay, Chris. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, I switched to uh, off my Wi-Fi. Um, <clears throat> And uh, sorry, the, uh, the lack of data available for securing that our economic landscape in Rosslyn can accommodate both stores, um, I'm still, it's still vague to me. Couple that with the you know, 10 to one in letters that we've received against um, or concern or against uh, is, is of concerning to me. Um, and then you know, the, the recommendations of city staff is important to me. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, this is hard for me right now. Uh, I'm not quite here yet. Okay, who else wants to speak? Dennis, Andy, Stu, Stu, jump in. I'll speak. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I'm not claiming to know whether this is a viable business or not, but I, I, I just don't see that that's our concern. I mean, this is a, this is a legal business operate, you know, proposing to operate in a place where we decided where it was supposed to be based on public consultation where you know the public said they went were fine with more than one store you know i mean i i you know i i fear this is devolving into a bit of a personality choice um you know i mean i we we all like the the, the current business owner in town he runs a good business he's a he's a good person and you know they're they're a good addition to main street and you know, I, I understand the sympathy. I feel it myself that, you know, it would probably be putting him in a difficult spot, allowing competition to come in and then it's going to be a fight for, you know, who's, who's going to be profitable. But, you know, I don't, I don't see that that's our role to pick winners in this sort of thing. This is, this is the, this is the market that decides these things. You know, we don't, we don't choose whether, you know, you know whether we're going to allow another restaurant in town because it might cut into the profits of people we like. It just it just seems beyond our responsibilities. Um, yeah, I'll I'll be I'll be voting against this. Okay, Andy, you are next, and then uh, Dirk again. But I'll check in with Janice since she hasn't spoken yet. So, Andy, you're up. I uh, like like um, Chris and Dirk. Um, I'm challenged, and Stu. I'm challenged to weigh the value and the and the advantages and disadvantages of voting for and against this one. Uh, as much as I um, am concerned about interfering in um, in a competitive market, I don't think that's part of council's responsibility. Uh, however, one of the things that I did uh, take strong uh, credences was was the comments that were received by many of our citizens. I also did my own little poll in, in amongst my friends and acquaintances and it seems pretty unanimous that they would like to see just the one uh, marijuana shop um, survive and hopefully uh, achieve some level of success in town. The other thing that I noted is that we received a number of, of uh, letters of non-support from our business community on the downtown core. And for me, that was a very strong, um, yeah, there were a couple that uh, were in favor of it, or at least one, but generally um, the majority that I heard weren't. And I think that's, uh, that for me was a very powerful message that our downtown core is still in a rebuilding phase. I still see empty storefronts and such, and I understand that this would be an opportunity to plug in a and have a storefront filled. But I think I want to see a continual uh, effort to have a mix of businesses in our community. And that's been the success to date, um, and certainly in the last uh, decade. 
where businesses have continued to grow and expand. And that diversity is bringing uh, other people from other communities into our, into our uh, downtown core to shop, which is pretty cool when you consider the possibilities and the potential of people going elsewhere in other communities and beyond. So I'm um, going to vote um, uh, for staff's uh, suggestion on this one um, and, and won't be approving this application. Okay, Janice. All right then. <laughs> it's, uh, um, I really appreciate Kevin's work in providing us with some background information about, uh, about what's happening in other communities around us, about what's happening in the industry. I think it's, uh, and he's very honest when we talked about the ratio of shops to population that, uh, you know, it's possible that some of those shops may or may not make it in the future. Some of them may fall by the wayside. Uh, but it does appear that uh, as it's going now, this is an emerging growing industry and um, the ratio of full population to uh, shops is not, um, we haven't exceeded that here. Um, I found it very interesting that there are almost 1800 products available from the province and no one shop carries all of them. So certainly there, I do agree with him that there's room for some differentiation of product as well as service and pricing. Um, the location, I mean, it's a downtown location. I realize that it's close to an existing shop. I understand the concerns about a bike shop beside a bike shop, a ski shop beside a ski shop, a chocolate shop beside a chocolate shop. Uh, but because we all are, are a small community, we have a limited number of storefronts. Um, so we can't necessarily say, well, you have to go look at the other end of town because there won't necessarily be a storefront available there. Um, yeah, and, and, you know, I don't think, uh, I don't think council, our job is really to make decisions that benefit and sustain the community. This one could go either way. We don't have a crystal ball to look at it. Um, it could benefit the community in that we would be filling another storefront, we'd have another commercial operation in town um, with the attendant uh, revenue that the city would uh, get from that as well as services for the community. It could go the other way and it could be too much for this community and we could lose two storefronts of commercial operations. So it's a really tough decision and I know it is for all of us. I am... Um, I will not be, because of the information that uh, Kevin and David have provided us, I won't be supporting uh, the staff recommendation on this particular issue at this time, unless someone else has something amazing to add that I haven't heard yet. Okay, Dirk, your hand is up. Um, I, th I think I just wanted to point out that this is, uh, to, to me and through this has not been about picking winners or losers or competition or anything like that. The, the task that we were given by the province is just to look at those four things, whether or not we're well served, um, the community views on it. And to me, that would be recent community views post legalization. Once we know what the landscape is like, um, if the region is, or if we have regulated access and all of those things, we have regulated access. The community has expressed quite clearly uh, reasons why they wouldn't uh, support this. And then, um, or not, not support the shop, but support a second shop. And then, uh, and then the consideration, the province has asked us to look at uh, location. And that was a tough one for me, but uh, you know, we have six shops within 15 minutes and I think location kind of becomes moot at that point. So for, I just wanted to point out that this was not a picking winners or losers. If we didn't like the current store owner, that wouldn't change whether or not we're currently well served by uh, non-medical cannabis or any of those other things. So I, for me, it's attempting to be objective based on what the province has tasked us with doing. Okay, any other comments? All right, well, I have a few. Um, you know, I, I would, in my heart of hearts, I would like to support the staff recommendation um, because it, for me, it's kind of an image thing. You know, I think our town has a lot of charm. It's very 
you know, it's, it's very cute and friendly and, you know, that's a lot. And we heard that from some of the other store owners that they, they actually really appreciate that about it. But I recognize that's my own prejudice because, you know, I look at, I look at cannabis as kind of like alcohol and the prohibition. I mean, it's getting more and more accepted. There's more and more, you know, as, as we've heard, all the different products that, that, that people use for different things. Um, so it's, it's, it's just, it's a, it's a product its time is developing. Like personally, I prefer not to have two, but I don't really feel justified in voting for the staff recommendation because I do feel we'd be picking winners and losers. And I do really rely on that poll that we did where there was a huge number of people. We had 500 people who responded. Now, maybe they'd answer differently now, now that it's legal, but maybe they wouldn't. And we really, you know, we've had a number of people who wrote and said that, that they wanted, wanted us to, you know, to limit it to one. But unless we went back and redid the large survey where we get 500, I don't feel like I can discount that at, at this point. Um, you know, that, so that to me was the most, was the most uh, compelling reason. You know, obviously we have a small downtown. There's really no other place to put it with the conditions that we put on being away from schools and all that. And, I, and I'm not that bothered that it's in the same block as the other store. Um, I think we, we do have to think of the greater good of the community in the long run. We have a lot of tourists who come. Tourists are interested in legal cannabis. Um, I like the idea of getting a tenant in the Leroy Mall. I share Janice's concerns that we could end up losing one or two good businesses because neither of them can survive. Um, but that really is up to market forces. So I, I don't think we can, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, don't, I, don't think we can, I don't think we can say no, un unfortunately, because honestly, I, I would like to. One thing that I really did like about the applicant's um, offer was that they would be willing to postpone the issuance of the city license for 18 months in order to allow businesses affected by COVID-19 to recover. And of course that gives them time to get their shop in, in place and, and that's good. It'll take them a while to get that built out. But I think that's important. And I also think uh, having the, the store closed by seven is important. I don't really want to encourage nine o'clock or 10 o'clock or you know, other later evening hours um, for this kind of industry. And again, that goes back to my prejudice, but there it is. Um, so I will vote uh, against this, uh, this recommendation and hopefully we'll see another recommendation on the table. But it was a very difficult decision for me too. Not helped by some, some of the people writing in favor of it. <laughs> but anyway, okay, so call the question on this one. All in favor of the staff recommendation? Okay, and opposed? So 3-3, three, three, it fails. So we need another, uh, another motion on the table. Someone like to make it? Janice or Stu, you guys are most sure. likely. I'll, I'll make a motion. Okay. I'll make a motion that we um, support the application. Okay. Um, can we, are you, are you willing to add anything about delaying the start for 18 months or request different hours than what's in the application or you want to leave it the way it is? I'm, I'm fine with it. I don't. Okay. We have I, 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 I don't share your prejudice about, <laughs> I don't okay. share your prejudices, Kathy. To me, it's just another business. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. Um, okay. So Janice, are you seconding it? Okay. Okay. All in favor of the motion to uh, grant the application. Stu, are you raising your hand? You are. Okay, I'm not. So that motion fails. So can we get a second motion? Or actually, we're on a third motion. What, what, what could that be? Well, it could be. Are we at, are we at an impasse? <laughs> no, 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 we're not. You could, you could make the motion that we, allow, that we allow the application to go forward with the condition that they wait for 18 months before they have their business license and that they change their hours to something other than nine o'clock. Well, maybe if, if you think that's something that would enable you to support it, maybe you should make that motion. I'll make the motion. Janice will second it. Okay, 
So all in favor of supporting the application with those two conditions. Okay, two, that motion fails. Oh, no, we're, okay, so, oh yeah, we are at an impasse now. Three, three, it fails. Okay, so does anyone have any other, any motions? Janice, make a motion. I think we only have one left. Okay. <laughs> I will make a motion to defer a decision about any additional uh, legal cannabis stores until we have... Um, Seven counters? <laughs> no, until, until we have the opportunity to gather more public input regarding the number of stores in town. Okay. Okay, so a second. Or, or an uneven number of councillors. Yeah, or an uneven number of councillors. Yeah. Okay, so we need a second. comes first. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Chris seconds the motion. Uh, Cynthia, you have those motions? Cynthia? Yes, okay, good. Okay, so we're deferring until some future time. Uh, oh, Dirk, you want to speak? Uh, do we have to tie something to that deferral? I mean, uh, I, I see us getting into a position where we get 322 respondents in September, and that still doesn't supersede the 503 we got when everybody was excited about legalization. I see this as an unending spiral where, uh, you know, we've been given questions by the province that are quite objective. We can answer those questions, I feel. Uh, I just... I don't know what target we would have that. in a deferral. Uh, Janice, do you yeah, want I mean, you, 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 to put some more detail on your motion? Uh, I was just thinking that uh, we would have more current information from a survey that was put out to the public after legalization had occurred. It's been a year and four months since it's been legalized-ish, I think, something like that. Um, and, uh, and also after our um, community has had the opportunity to see how a, how a um, legal cannabis shop, recreational cannabis shop operates in our community and that some of some of the things they thought were going to happen didn't happen, or some of the things they didn't understand would happen have happened. Okay. Kevin, I'm going to call on you in a minute, but I want to let the counselor speak first, and I, I will let you speak. I think Stu was next, and then Andy. Yeah, I mean, I just, uh, you know, I appreciate your perspective there, Dirk, but I mean, these are not matters of fact, they're matters of opinion about whether the criteria that the province sets out. I mean, we have, we have, we have different perspectives on the matter. Um, you know, I think our, our impasse here is that we are taking, we are interpreting them differently, and the problem is we only we have an even number of people to coming to a decision. So, to me, the, you know, the, I, I don't think further public consultation is necessarily going to make a difference. I mean, it might. I mean, I'm open to whatever information we get in the interim, but I, I suggest the only way to move forward on these sort of hung issues is actually having a by-election. Okay, Andy? I think that uh, what I'd like to see is, uh, uh, and I'd like to Janice. Uh, Andy, you're breaking up. This is idea, by the way, about getting a bit more public consultation. Sorry. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Uh, well, maybe, try talking. Um, okay, here we are. Um, it's, uh, yeah, the, the, uh, the idea of having a core ball surveying as well. So I'd like to have our business community weigh in a little more uh, on this topic. Okay. And staff, comment from staff? Oh, we just wanted to double check who the seconder was for that motion. We missed it. Sorry. Okay. Oh, Janice made it and Chris seconded it. Okay. Thank okay. you. Okay. Yep. Kevin, would you like to add to the discussion? You can be our seventh counselor, and then, then we know where it's going. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, eh? Uh, basically, what I'd just like to add is we're more than happy to de defer for two years. Like, we have no desire to come into the market and push another store out. Uh, we wouldn't be coming in as the second store if we didn't feel like there was room. Um, so we're more than happy to defer for two years and also allow this store to develop. Let the, uh, the market also develop. 
and also let the price point drop down to the point where we are beating the black market. And we are very close right now to the point where we are beating it in a lot of areas already. And we're going to be beating it by next year quite easily. Um, so by the de deferring two years, it, it allows the black market to naturally get itself out of the game. It allows that store to develop and get nice and strong and get a good customer base under it. And then we'd move in. And the likelihood of one failing, it would be us because we would have to be taking the customers from that store realistically. Um, so we'd be more than happy to do that. Um, I just wanted to put that out there. Thank you, that's very generous. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'll call on everyone to speak, but keep that in mind. If someone wanted to try again with a motion saying do this and have it be in two years instead. David, I'll get you in a second, but let me go back and see if the staff have something else to add. Your little blue oh. hand is up. Okay. Oh yeah, sorry. That's okay. that. There you go. I'm going to go to Dirk and then David. I think uh, <clears throat> I support deferring this, uh, deferring the decision, not deciding and deferring the license, but deferring the decision for two years for more information. Um, I think maybe a question for staff. Sometimes these deferrals uh, result in a restart. And I, I don't know if I, I, I would prefer to not have a restart. I feel like Kevin and David and Warren have done enough effort that they should be first in line. I just want to make sure that if we defer to two years, it's not going to kick them out of the queue, so to speak. Uh, staff, do you have a comment on that? No, I don't think that would be, that would be an issue. There's a clear, okay. there's clear direction that if we were going to be looking at this, that we're deferring the decision based on this particular application with additional public consultation on this application that we would um, you know, if that was to be for certainty, what we could do is after this is passed, we could also make it another motion to have a moratorium on other applications until such time that this one um, this gets decided upon. Yeah. yeah. Okay, David. I was just going to add to Kevin's um, uh, points. There was that the market for uh, legal cannabis within one uh, within a shop like ours is not your typical. Um, pot smoker. It's not the typical um, image that most people have when they think of someone who, who uses cannabis. Those people may never go inside a, le a legitimate legal licensed store. The growth for the market is, and what we are seeing firsthand within our store in Warfield is, as Kevin had alluded to earlier, it's CBD products and it's edibles and it's going to be more on the liquids and things like that. It's going to be um, not the typical cannabis smoker. So the, the market has potential to grow significantly outside of the typical pot user, if, if, if you're understanding my, my, uh, my gist here. And um, those folks need a good, uh, a good store to go to. They need a good shop where they can walk in. It's like having multiple dentist office. I'll use this analogy instead of the cars. Some dentist offices are very nice and welcoming and warm and comfortable, and others are not. You wouldn't go there. You get a bad vibe from it. We, we endeavor strongly to provide a great experience, and it's, that's the customer that we attract. That's our client. Those people are our growth market, and that's all okay. I have. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, David. Okay, so, Dirk, your little blue hand is up. Do you want to speak again? No. Oh. Okay. Okay. So the motion on the table is that we defer this until we get further public input. That's the motion. There's the opportunity to do something else if this one doesn't pass. Janice, did you raise your hand or are you voting? No, I did raise my hand actually. Um, depending, you know, after the conversation has gone around, I don't know um, based on council's discussion if it's really public input that we want to wait for, if it's, or if we just want to defer the whole process with the moratorium as suggested by Brian for uh, 24 months. Uh, doing another survey may be tough on, you know, staff time and cost. I mean, we may be spending time and money we don't need to spend, uh, whereas we might have much more clarity in two years without doing that. So, uh, well, so I, if, yeah. if council wants to change the movement to just a straight timeline, uh, rather than looking for more public input, I'm happy to amend the motion that way. Okay. Um, yeah, well, I mean, obviously, if we had seven people on council right now, the decision would be made. So that's really what we're coming down to here is 
is that. Okay, Kevin, I'm going to say one more thing. Usually we don't have applicants in the discussion, but go ahead. Thank you. I really appreciate that. I just wanted to touch on that. We'll be more than happy with the seven, uh, seven o'clock um, issue as well. Um, that's no issue because I was closing earlier. Um, and that's pretty much it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. okay, so the motion on the table is that we defer until we have public input. Oh, Stuart, are you voting? Are you? Oh, no, you're speaking. Sorry, I didn't see the blue hand. Yeah, I'm, I'm just concerned that the, the previous consultation we did was, you know, seemed to me fairly reliable consultation because it was done in the abstract. Um, people were just considering the issue. Um, I, I think under the current circumstances, people would be, you know, considering which business they like and that, you know, lobbying for and against would be occurring. And I don't, I don't know whether that's necessarily going to provide good quality guidance on the issue. You know, it's going to be clouded by the, the issue at hand, not the, not the actual subject matter. So you can vote against the defer till public input and perhaps- I don't, think, I, I don't think public input the under the time. current circumstances would be valuable. Yeah, okay. Okay, I'm going to call the question on deferring until there's public input. Who's in favor of that? Oh, goes, oh, Andy's in favor. Dirk's in favor and, oh shoot. Okay, we got four in favor, it looks like. Everybody raise your hands for sure. You're in favor of it. Chris, you're in favor of it? Okay, sorry, we keep having hands popping yeah. up. And, okay, okay, so an opposed would be Stu and I, and so that motion passes. So we're gonna defer until we have public input. I would have been great to defer until we have seven members of council. <laughs> but anyway, okay, that passes. And so I think we're done on this issue, okay? All right, going back. Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate you coming to the meeting. And uh, we will keep you apprised of whatever we end up doing for public engagement. So. Uh, All right, thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, so now we are, oh, shoot. You know, I totally skipped adopting the minutes from the regular meeting on June 3rd. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Cynthia, you should have yelled at me. <laughs> or did you, did you try? <laughs> You're just waiting patiently. That's okay. <laughs> oh, you guys are good. Okay, so can I get a mover for those minutes? And okay, it's Andy and Janice. Any comments on those minutes? All in favor? Good. Everybody good. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay, so now up to Solid Waste Collection Disposal Services Review and Award Follow-Up. And the staff recommendation is that we award the contract to Alpine um, that with the conditions in both their original request and the additional information that was included. We have a mover for that or something else. Janice moves it, a seconder. Somebody raised their hand. Dirk raises his hand. Okay, so this means we're going to go back to having the small bag for $1.50, but the big one's being raised to three and everything else is kind of good to go. Any discussion? Uh, Dirk, discussion? Or are you voting? Uh, uh, no, I had discussion. Yeah. Uh, unless Janice wanted to go first. You want to talk garbage? Or who, whoever went? I was only no, a second. You go, you go ahead, Dirk. Okay. Just um, uh, the note that was in the, the new report said that there were issues or known issues with bag sizes. And I, I think it would be good for the city to help with that. Uh, work with Ferraros to get a bunch of the right size bags in and have them labeled because what Stu pointed out last time, same thing with me, I, I have no idea. I just get the biggest one I can um, and then put it out as less often as I can. So I think it would be good um, for the city to help kind of inform Ferraros. That's where we get most of our bags. And, and then kind of the second part of that is that my concern was once we start using the correct size bags, then the tipping fees are gonna go down relative to the number of stickers. It just kind of puts us in that conundrum if we're, we've got this sticker price based on the knowledge that we are abusing the tag sizes. And if we stop abusing the tag sizes, then we're paying more than the more we already are. Okay, so we can vote on this contract and then we can have another motion to, I don't know if we want to direct staff to work with Ferraros or really that's up to to Alpine to work with Ferraros to get the bags, we could take on some role in communicating about the proper bags, but 
our communications don't always result in action by our populace. But anyway, uh, Stuart, you have your hand up. Yeah, I just can't imagine anything we're going to do or say is going to make any difference to people that want to, you know, get a slightly bigger bag than is actually allowed. <laughs> yeah, I mean, some of it could be ignorance, right? Some of them don't know the limitations. Um, I'm going to go to staff and then to Andy and then to Dirk. Yeah, so in previous correspondence that we do, anytime that we have any issues or Alpine brings anything to the city's attention, we do the best that we can to help promote messaging in regards to um, their activities. So this would be the same ideas that we would re send out some information about a new collection. Um, you know, really, to be honest with you, the it would actually be the opposite of Councillor Lewis's comments there is that is that people are the, the abuse of the system that we've heard from Alpine in recently discussions is that people buy the small bag, try to put more garbage into a bigger bag and use that sticker and then plead the fifth when that company come or when Alpine comes and Alpine in, in order to do good customer service and not to provide any type of um, further detriment to the individual that's having the issue with not being having the right garbage sticker on the right bag and having the city involved, they'll usually pick it up, which means that they are taking a loss on the um, on the tipping fee side of things, which again is not our fault and it's not our problem, but we also want to make sure that we provide the, the program in place that we are looking to apply. And again, obviously the sticker pricing is part of the new bylaw that would have to be amended. So we would be having some type of enforcement in regards to making sure that Alpine has some teeth when they don't pick up garbage and the communication is clear that this is why that happened, that that, that complaint usually comes to the city for us to take care of. So yeah, we would be actively involved with uh, communication on that front. Okay, thanks. Um, Andy, I think was next. Andy, you're frozen. His hand is up, but he's frozen. I don't know if he can hear me or not. <laughs> he looks anguished. I, know. He, <laughs> he looks anguished. I hope this stuff doesn't happen when we get back to the miners' hall. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Andy, did you want to speak? Uh, I was just going to thank staff for also bringing up the issue around um, uh, curbside collection of organics. And I think that's an important conversation that once organic uh, diversion starts happening, that we're going to be in a position to uh, talk openly about what changes are going to be um, when it comes to, to, you know, the cost to the consumer. Yeah. So we'll see, we'll see how that all goes, but I do appreciate that's now written. It will be written into the contract. Yeah. That'll be a conversation for another day for sure. Okay. I'm going to yeah. call the question on this one. If everybody's ready, all in favor of accepting the contract as we now see it. All right. Yay team. Okay, let's go into some quick policy reviews. Freedom of the city is the first one. The staff recommendation is that we reconfirm it. Dirk makes the motion. Do we have a seconder? Well, I, make a, I make a different motion or a tweak. Oh, motion. you want to make a tweak? Okay. Yeah, I'd rather make the motion that we have it pretty much as is, taking out distinguished unit of the armed forces and throwing in volunteer organization. I don't know why we need to have distinguished unit of armed forces in there. Volunteer organization seems more appropriate. Uh, hold on here. Let me... Well, I think it's, it, you know, some like distinguished <laughs> military <laughs> unit does something great, you know, on our behalf in the big wide world. So you would yeah. say, okay, so that's to give special honor to a person. So a person or a distinguished unit of the, well, okay, freedom in the city is like the highest honor. It's not like our it's not like our volunteer of the year, or we, we, we do our community contributor award. This is different. This is like, you know, this one we're gonna, if some Rosander saves the life of the prime minister, we give them the distinguished unit, of, you know, give them the, the what is freedom of the city. I mean, freedom of the city is a really big deal. So I think I, special honor, a person could be a volunteer. Um, I, I, I think leave the, the person, am I still on? Leave yeah. the person in there, just swap out uh, the uh, the armed forces unit with volunteer organization. I mean, it reads through here that it needs to be a volunteer group anyways, not a paid group. So if it's a volunteer armed forces unit, then they're covered by volunteer organization. I don't think we need to have that in there. 
individual and volunteer organization. It's my preference. Right, right. You know, what, if, what, 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 what if a business does something particularly heroic? Yeah, if I'm they're doing it as a volunteer, then I'd say <laughs> sure. If they're not, if they're being paid to do something heroic, then no, they don't get that. Yeah, okay. Okay, so Janice, you had your hand up? You're muted. Sorry, between lowering my hand and speaking, I kind of missed that part. Uh, <laughs> I, think that, I think the intent of having a unit, a military unit in there, is uh, if we were to have a natural disaster where the military had to come out and uh, help us out, um, that, uh, that's where we might choose to honor them with the freedom of the city. So I kind of don't mind leaving it in there because how many, how often are we going to have units in the military, even in Rossland, let alone doing something for us? So if we do, it's probably because we really, 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 really need them. Yeah. Okay. Stuart and then Dirk. I mean, just looking at this thing, it just seems so archaic. It's like this relic from another time. Yeah. Um, you know, do we ever actually do this? I mean, when was the last time we actually awarded the freedom of the city? Yeah, you know what? I meant to ask that question of staff. I don't know if anybody has it at their fingertips, but I have no idea. <laughs> I we I don't think that we've ever had. I don't know for sure. I mean, it's only been this policy's only, <laughs> this policy's only been in place since 2010, so I can't think of any time we've done that. What? 2010. 2010. So it, it says effective date was May 25th to 2010. I, that can't be right. This has got to be back to like 1896 or something. You know. What I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So so how about just so we don't spend too much time on this? How about if we just say we give special honor to a person or a distinguished unit of the armed forces or a volunteer group if they do something extraordinary? Just include it. So we won't exclude the military that comes to evacuate us all by helicopter off our rooftops in case that ever happens. Um, Wouldn't they be being paid? Oh, oh that's true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's true. They'd be paid. Okay, Andy. And they could be against it. <laughs> well, yeah, I, exactly my sentiments. This seems to be back from, from a previous era for sure. But um, I... I I can see potential to get blowback on this one from a certain group of people. Um, so uh, I'm okay with the idea of leaving the armed forces in there, uh, but also include uh, volunteer organizations as well. Okay. Dirk. Uh, since, it was, since it was my motion, I'm, I'm happy to leave armed forces in there on phase one of my domination plan. Um, and then also put volunteer organization in there because I think that's left out. And okay. I, I do think that an armed forces unit would be paid to be here. So yeah, yeah, I got a seventh, seventh and eighth votes if we need them. Well, yeah, that's right. <clears throat> Where were they on the last issue? Um, yeah, you know, I had, I had missed the part about being a <clears throat> volunteer. Okay, uh, okay, Janice, are you waving to the kids? You're waving to the kids. Hi, Mava. Okay, Stuart, you've got your hand up. Oh, yeah, I just, this, 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 this just seems all really silly to me. I'm against it. Yeah. Yeah, I could kind of do without it myself. Um, yeah, where it's volunteer work. Oh, yeah, okay. Okay, right now we have a motion on the table that we're adding volunteer group to the list of entities who could get the freedom of the city. Okay, so do we, do we have a seconder on that? Who seconded the original? Janet seconded. <clears throat> okay, sorry, I'm choking on something. Any other comments, Stu? You've got your hand still up. Oh, sorry. sorry. No. Okay, so as uh, Dirk, you have your hand still up. Anything further you want to say? No, okay. Okay, I'll call the question. All in favor as amended. Okay, looks like it passes. Andy and Stuart are opposed. Okay, good. You anti-militant types, that's great. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> okay. So half-masting the Canadian flag, that we reconfirm the policy as presented. And as you know, item O in there was what we used when we um, uh, half-masted the, the flag for Nova Scotia. Uh, Janice, making the motion. Okay, and Andy seconding it. Any discussion on this? All, oh, yes. Yes. Uh, I, I sort of feel the same way about this as I feel about the um, freedom of the city, but... 
my, my, my sense is that there's probably more community support for it than there is for freedom of the city. So I'm happy to let them have their flag raising and half masting. Yeah. Okay. Um, Andy, you're muted. Like the idea that we have that flexibility. And I think that's important to maintain, you know, council at this council's discretion. Okay. I, I, I would, I would be happy to take all the rest of the, um, details out uh just basically leave it at council's discussion. hey no come on i want to i want to have man the flag at half mast if i keel over in office <laughs> okay i'm going to call the question on this one so all in favor okay anyone opposed not soon andy are you opposed you're blo you're frozen i don't know i'm it's saying opposed or for no that we were yeah i'm for it I'm Okay, okay. You're, you're frozen, so I can't, I can't okay. tell. And it might be too hard to raise hands for voting, but it, it might help on some of these things. Okay, now we're on to proclamations, that we reconfirm the proclamation as presented. Um, so, anybody want to reach that one? Okay, Dirk is the, is the mover, Janice is the seconder. Dirk, you want to speak? Nope, you don't want to speak? Okay, you're muted anyway. Janice? Yeah, no. I, I think the policy as it stands is a good one. Uh, if we start making proclamations, we're bound to miss someone, which just ends up, uh, you know, with people being disappointed and or angry. Yeah. Any other comments? I don't know if Chris is frozen or just gone. Oh, no, there he's there. Any comments? No, I'm pretty good. The only thing I would say is that um, uh, when we look at our policy about our city sign, um, I would like to have the city have the latitude to put messages up if we wanted to, like if we wanted to say something, you know, social justice, Black Lives Matter, you know, whatever we wanted to say. I would like us to have that latitude, but that's not under the proclamations. That would be when we see the sign, the sign policy come back. Uh, Andy, did you want to speak? No, I just uh, was going to ask you if we wanted to put um change this to include that but it, but find a wait until the sign policy comes back yeah i think that's more appropriate in the sign policy unless staff tells me differently uh stuart yeah i'd just like to make you know, i'd like to support our anti-proclamation policy and and try and limit us to uh wherever possible to staying within our lane our uh our operating the municipality in a in a responsible manner there's many many other issues in the world but you know, I, I, I do remember that circle that we looked at in our orientation and, you know, our area of responsibility. Um, you know, there, there always seems, seems to be a lot of creep of, uh, you know, trying to use this platform to deal with the many, many other things. And, you know, I, I guess I'd just like to encourage us to, to try and just focus on what our actual responsibilities are where we can. I think that's a good point. And we certainly do that in proclamations, but we are also community leaders and sometimes I think it's important to show leadership and things that maybe we don't have control of but that we can stand up and support but we can talk about that when we get to the sign policy okay all in favor of the proclamation policy as is which is we don't do it okay great okay advertising and promotions that we reconfirm the advertising and promotion policy mover Janice and Andy any comments? No. Dirk, you have your hand up or are you voting? Well, I, had, I think I saw Janice comment on it too. The, uh, we, we specified that we were going to communicate with Rossland News. Does that, does that need to stay in there? Am I on the right one? Advertising? Yeah. I, I don't think, I think we could scrub that out. I mean, maybe news, we could communicate with news or we could not communicate with news. But I don't know why we had to specify that. Okay, any comments? So we could Are we are we still doing that? Do we've got the do we have the every two week uh information advertisement in the Ross and News? Yes? Yes, yes we, we do. do. Yes. I mean we do, but I, I appreciate Dirk's point. It doesn't have to be the Rosal News, it could be the Telegraph, it could be some other publication elsewhere if we if we're <laughs> saying by name. So that's not actually written in the policy. It's just written in the staff report from Allison here, but I, about the Roslyn News uh, column that uh, we organize. Okay, so it's just used as an example. It's not, yeah. Okay, perfect. 
Janice, do you have anything else to say? Your hands up. No. Okay. All in favor? Call in the question. Okay. Good. Um, okay. So now we have an update to our COVID uh, COVID pandemic policy that has now already been amended in this fast moving time. Uh, who wants to move that? Chris does. Chris and Stuart, you're going to second it. Just because you guys haven't been active, you know. Janice has been doing all the heavy lifting. Okay, anybody have any comments on that? Looks good. All in favor? Raise those little paws. Excellent. Okay, community grant in aid. Here we go. This is a bigger one. So, we need to provide further direction to staff regarding proposed amendments. So, what further direction would we like to give staff? Who wants to start us off? Stuart and then Dirk. Yeah, I like the, uh, the two streams. I like the evaluation worksheet. I thought it would at least provided some sort of framework for evaluating things. Um, yeah, I, I, thought the, uh, I thought they're heading in the right direction. I'd like to have that and something we can vote on. Okay, that's good, Dirk. Uh, I, I had two thoughts on it. I, I, I don't, I'm not sure I quite understand why we wouldn't have a bigger, more permanent groups like the library and KCPS and the museum and SC have just their own outside of this operating agreements. Um, it seems like we're not getting into the splitting the pie questions and everybody's fighting for the same dollars. I think they should be on their own merit and outside of the grant and aid. And then the other thing, I, I think that there should be a, a grant and aid of under, I don't know, $2,000. The city will fund all of it. If it's over $2,000, then the applicant needs to come with another source of matched funding so that to try to drive some outside funds in. I mean, that happens with a lot of the groups, you know, well, KCTS, the museum. But I think they're big enough. They should be honored with their own operating agreement. Well, they are going to have their own operating agreement. What, what I'm hearing you say, and I may be misunderstanding you, is that you're looking to have them have their own line item in the budget, as opposed to coming under a community, you know, the community fund? Well, I, I guess if that's how it would have to work budgeting-wise, I, I don't see the importance of having them lumped into this. I think they should, I mean, they're big enough and important enough that they should have their own daily job. Yeah. In my, in my view, I don't, I mean, I don't have a problem with them here. I just think they should have their own. Well, the only challenge with that is that they aren't city, they, they aren't, they're, they're separate entities. You know, like KCPS mm. is, a, is a society, I mean, they're all societies, right? So, I, I mean, I'll, I'll throw that over to staff and, and uh, get, a, get input from there. Well, just, can I just have one follow-up on that? Then sure. would, would they come into the grant and aid with an operating agreement? and already have a budget decided or I mean you can't really do an operating agreement and then have your budget cut in half or doubled I mean it just it, it takes the you know the point of the grant and aid is that we sit down collectively and decide where we want to put this pot of money and if they're coming with an operating agreement presumably they have a really good idea of the pot of money that will need to enact that operating agreement My, my understanding is that the, the the organizations that would be in this more permanent stream would have those those more permanent funding arrangements that it wouldn't be subject to you know the whims of every council every year that the goal would be that they are multi year and more established and that yeah. you know i mean that, I, I thought I thought that was the intention of what we're doing yeah I think that is uh, Cynthia. Um, just to clarify, I mean, this is up to council as well to provide direction for, is that the operating grants are generally, or will be sort of those line items in the budget. So you're, we're talking about two different pots of money, but this is an application process for them to be vetted through council. Um, there is an item there saying that operating grant should be for a term of four years and um, no longer. Again, that's council's will to change that. However, it would be nice to have some checks and balances as councils, councillors change um, so that items can be revisited um, ongoing. 
Yeah, I, I definitely was not in favor of having it coincide with a council's term because sometimes new counselors come in and they're like, hey, throw the bums out. We're going to do everything differently. And without knowing the benefit of the groups that are that are being funded, I think it should be it should be four year term, four year agreements, but maybe they happen in the middle of the council's term. So each council gets an understanding of what that group does and contributes. And then if they don't like it after two years, they can cut them off for their last two years. But um, I didn't like, I, I, that was one thing about it that, that I didn't like. Okay, I've lost track of who has their hands up because nobody does. Who wants to talk? We're talking, we're just kind of having discussion at this point about what things, what direction we'd like to give to staff. Janice. Well, when I was reading it through, I mean, it looks like it's all moving in the right direction. Um, I agree with Cynthia and yourself, Kathy, about, uh, about four years. I mean, the point of having successive councils is that they are democratically elected and the needs or the desires of the community may have changed based on who they voted in. So uh, it's not really the whim of council, it's the whim of the community. Council spoke, we're supposed to speak for them. Um, I did notice, uh, I was just looking at the funding um, formula. So we currently have it set up. So I think it's 5.62% of our uh, taxation. As we're working through the operating agreements um, with our different groups, um, and as we start including, you know, part of it is to include all the costs and services that the city provides to each organization. Uh, it is it, because we have been keeping track of it financially piecemeal. So there's the grant and aid portion, there's the operating portion, you know, it can be in multiple pots. As we uh, conglomerate all of that uh, and all the operation agreements start to, are, start to mirror each other so they all look the same, it will probably look like our grant and aid or our community support for the amount of money we're spending goes up, even though it'll be the same amount of money. It's just that it won't be hidden away in an operating line somewhere or a facility line or, or, or. So I think we just need to be, uh, we need to be cognizant of that. When we look at things like the 5.62%, that number just needs to be really flexible until we get our agreements so they're all in line and the same. Otherwise, we risk cutting someone off who doesn't deserve to be or or not being able to support someone new who comes in who would be very um, beneficial to the community. Well, I think part of that little financial chart was taking the uh, parcel and, and local area taxes out of it and just having it be a, a higher number based on our actual tax revenue, which which is fine. But I absolutely agree with you because when we get this lined up, if you, if you look at what we spend on the you know, sort of on the public work side of the operation, the maintenance of these facilities that we own, that is not going to fit into that 5.6 or even if it were 6%. So I think we do need to be flexible. And I think, obviously, I think staff knows that, right? We're not going to, not going to, not going to cut anybody off in that, in that regard. Okay, what else? What are other, what other comments? Do we have anything else? So, Dirk. All right, I think I, I'd like to, personally, I'd like to see if I, if I were on the other side of it, the operating agreements not be tied to a four-year funding decision. I mean, if you have a six, 10-year window, like a horizon to look out for your planning and your budgeting, you get more out of an organization if they're planning that far ahead. And I, I don't know, I, I, I feel like the, those groups are big enough. I mean, the SC is a good example. They got just trounced by one of the the councils and the efficacy went down and you know the planning and the ability of that group was diminished because of the whims of and they're in a bylaw so I, I think that uh you know uh, it's better for the city better for the community and better for the organizations if they have a longer horizon and more certainty well that's true but you know we do five-year plans that's as a municipality we do five-year plans um i mean obviously we have a longer planning horizon too and going back to Janice's point, I mean, the reason that the SC got trounced is because the people that were elected by the citizens of Roslyn didn't support the Sustainability Commission, whereas previous councils really had and subsequent councils did. But, you know, so, so we are somewhat, uh, you know, volunteer groups and services that the community provide are subject to the whim of, I don't want to say whim, but yeah, we are supposed to be representative of the community. And so if, if the community elects a bunch of people 
who, you know, are all a bunch of climate change deniers, then policies in the city are going to change radically, right? But that's what the community, you know, you, you get the government you deserve, you know? So I think there's that. I, I have a question for Janice. So Janice, because I was kind of on a, on a different point, what I was saying about, I actually didn't like the four-year contract for the groups aligning with a council election because I didn't feel a new council coming in would really have a, a, a good enough understanding of what any of the groups did unless they had a little experience with them. But I kind of got the sense you were saying, well, if the, t the temperature of the community changes, then they shouldn't be tied to previous council's decision about groups. Is that what you were saying? Were you supporting no, the- No, I, I, I like the idea of having uh, the four year review fall right smack dab in the middle of every council's, okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. In the middle or, you know, in either the second or end of the second or sometime during the third up to the beginning of the fourth year. I, th I like the idea of that. Um, I think we all know when we became counselors that we were drinking from a fire hose to uh, get up to speed, no matter how engaged in the community we were to start with. So, uh, yeah, no, I like the idea of having the review be uh, midterm somewhere. I think midterm makes sense because honestly, if there are changes that the community wants to see and they elected people to make those changes, it shouldn't have to wait until the third term, third year of that council's term. But second year is fine. That gives them time to really understand what they're looking at. Okay, Stuart, you have your little blue hand up. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think these organizations have to be accountable to council and to the community. I, I just, uh, I, I'm, I'm hoping that this, this arrangement, the way we're setting it up is such that those will be, those will be informed decisions. I don't want, you know, the, the, the roles these organizations play in the community to be decided by the whims of people. Absolutely not. I want, you know, a, a standard reporting. I want, you know, all the information, you know, easily digestible and understandable by people. And I, and I, and I like the idea of the, the staggered, uh, timeline, but all, you know, to me, all these things are to make sure that these are well-informed decisions. Um, yeah. You know, with you know that we have a, you know apples to apples comparison between different organisations and an ability to assess whether they are actually providing the value that we expect from them. And that that's that's where I want to want to get to. Okay, well, I think that that's definitely where we're going. Who else has some other comments? I think uh, Cynthia's busily taking notes on what we're saying here, right? Yes, good girl. Um, other other comments, Janice. The only thing I would I would say is uh, I I totally understand Stuart's uh, desire to get to an apples to apples comparison, but unfortunately, all our groups don't sell apples, uh, so it will never be perfect. But uh, if we can get it as close as we can, so that future councils can look at what our uh, our community groups are doing and how they're benefiting our community and uh, be able to see that in a clear picture. I think that's a great, uh, that'll be a great uh, thing for us to get in place. And I appreciate the hard work that's going into this. Yeah, I think this is a, a huge Im improvement for sure. Um, I had a couple other things. The, the grant and aid talks about that it may be freer for nominal admission that, um, you know, I, I see a couple of issues with that. Like we might be, they might be asking for a grant and aid for something. Let's say uh, uh, Youth Action Network wants to put on a fundraiser. And so they ask for a grant and aid to help defray some of the expenses, but they're gonna charge admission for it because it's actually a fundraiser. And there's some parts in here, I'm not even sure where it was that said that it wasn't for, couldn't be used for fundraisers or thing. And, and, and I'm not sure I'm not sure that really works. I think we, we, as a municipality, we could support, like we did for, what was it? It was for that um, fundraiser for the skate park. We'd put in, put in some money, some staff time and, and stuff. And then they raised money and gave it to the state skate park. I wouldn't want us to not be able to do those things because of language in this policy. They could, come, they could just come to us directly and ask for money. I mean, it doesn't well, have to be through, it doesn't have to be through this, this mechanism. Yeah, but we really don't give money much to people who come for this. This is where those kinds of requests are supposed are pretty much supposed to come, you know, when there's things people want us to do. So I don't know. I just think that we just need to look at the language on that. Um, 
I liked the uh, I liked the eligibility sheet. I was a little concerned that the public engagement white might weigh more heavily than anything else. I don't know if anybody else had any concerns on that, but um, and I, honestly, I don't know if it's a concern or not. But I just wanted to bring it up. And let's see. No, I guess that's that's really all I had. Anybody else have anything else? No, no. Okay, so Cynthia, you have a tiny bit of direction, but basically we pretty much like it, so. Any comments from staff? Yeah, I can, I can present a, an updated draft to council next time you meet. Um, I would suggest that for the um, evaluation sheet and the criteria that at some point council or a committee um, kind of drills those details down okay that we can we can look at that oh i did have one other thing on page 61 it talks about ineligible it says using the same we're using the same form right correct me if i'm wrong but we're using the same form if a group is going to apply for a capital grant or if they're not capital and then there's some language in there that says um capital projects aren't eligible uh, so that seemed a little confusing to me sorry what page 61. Page 61. So, yeah, and section seven, ineligible major capital expenditures, because they're using this. I mean, if they on the on the first page, they could say they want a capital thing, right? They could say capital project grant. Anyway, you just look at it, and when you come back, see if that is inconsistent to anybody else okay so i don't think we need to we've, we've given direction do we need to make that into a motion or are you okay with just this kind of conversation about it i think we can take this and, and work with it that's what i was hoping you could say thank you okay we're moving on to our new policy the anti-racism policy the staff recommendation is that we approve this new policy do i have a mover or do I have anyone who wants to make a different motion? Okay, I'm going to say Chris and Andy on this one. Chris? There you go. Yeah. Um, this is timely and long awaited. So um, I really like the way that it's laid out to begin with. And I don't really see anything that, that stands out. Um, that I would change at this point. I think it's a really good start. Okay, great. Andy, you were the seconder? Same. Uh, I did really like that. Um, I know I almost just found it on the weekend that I found that uh, visual that she had posted uh, very impactful and, and very simple. It would be nice if it could be included as well in the report, oh, and, you know, our policy. I just uh, thought it was, was a really was good clarification. What, what um, it was a, Alma can explain a little more, but uh, it was, it was an excellent uh, pictorial of, and, and diagram of just how, what it was, how important it was to be on a progressive side. Uh, just basically chain three different levels of, of, um, of support or lack of um, yeah. for racist for understanding policy. So yeah, I'm understanding. That's right. And, and uh, progressive action too. So I uh, really liked it. wonder if it could be included. Yeah, I guess, you know, that's really funny. I'm wondering if I didn't get that. Did I respond? <laughs> I'm not remembering it. Anyway. And it was only, I think it was only yesterday she put it, she posted it. Right? Oh. He said it as okay. an email. Well, staff, do you see any problem? Are we getting to copyright uh, uh, conflicts if we uh, post oh, that? It's just, it's just a visual. So we will do that, and then also there was, I think there was half of a definition that was missed off and another definition that was missed, so that will be added to the policy. Okay, I'm going to call on Stuart and then Dirk. Yeah, I had a uh, uh, concern about the language in the policy objective number one. Um, that the city of Roslyn acknowledges and recognizes the existence in our community of racism in all its forms. Uh, cultural, environmental, institutional, systematic, and individual. Um, you know, I, I think it's important to acknowledge that these issues exist um, and that if we were to identify them, 
um, that we should do something about them. Uh, these all seem valid to me, but you know, to have the, the, the first point in our policy that the, we, we acknowledge and recognize them in our community, it just doesn't seem factual. It hasn't been pointed out to me um, the ways in which they all exist and that we recognize them. Um, you know, I'm, I'm prepared to acknowledge that they may exist or there is the potential for them to become a problem and that they do exist in many places. Um, but to say that they are, this sort of implies that they are critical issues that we recognize right now. And I, I just don't find that factually accurate. Accurate. Well, if, if it is factual, then we're really bad that we haven't done anything about it. So I, I, think, I, I, I think that raises a good point. And I would love to hear from anyone on council or staff that would have, um, that, that would have some comments on, on what is actually happening in, in our community, not just the world in general. Dirk. You're muted. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, I, I think that um, while perhaps Stu is correct that there is no, I mean, there have been cases where there is not the overt racism that we're seeing certainly south of us or elsewhere. Um, there, there is a culture that allows for slightly racist transgressions. And, and I think this is the biggest issue that we're seeing sort of globally right now is that there's this general acceptance of a level of racism. And I, I think a big part of the discussion that's been going on is that it's, it's not good enough. And Elma's uh, image does a really good job of pointing this out. And to me, this policy goes to the don't be racist kind of level, but there's really good um, ideas and discussions going on that the onus is on us to be anti-racist. So to call out the offside joke that somebody in the works yard, not picking on the works yard, but, but, but that's, but th so that, that wasn't the point, point that I was making, Dirk. Well, my, my point is, is that, that I, I see the point that maybe, you know, we can't call out specific instances right now, but I think that it behooves us to have that in there. And it, I would like to recommend that we have in the roles and responsibilities, the responsibility to be anti-racist, to not slough off the off color joke or the, you know, the ill-timed accent or whatever might happen. I think that we do need as a society to go farther than just not being racist. We have to actively call it out. And it does occur uh, around I'm, 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 not, I'm not suggesting we shouldn't, Dirk, I'm not, that, that, that wasn't my point. Right. I, you know, I'm, I, I, think it's, I think it's very important and I think that's part of the discussion society's having right now is that we do, do need to acknowledge that racism isn't just racist acts, that there are these other ways in which racism can be systematic and institutional and, and these other ways. And I, and I, and I think it's important that those, that language is in there, that we acknowledge it. But that's not the same thing as saying that we recognize it in our community right now. That's, it, just, it just isn't the case. You know, we could, we could, there's lots of other language we could put in there that we, uh, we will not tolerate or that we acknowledge or, you know, we, you know I'm, we can wordsmith this however we want. But, uh, you know, I, I would just like it to be something that actually reflects reality, not just, you know, a statement for effect because that we, we don't. I, um, as far as I can tell, I don't think we do recognize these things in our community right, right now. Well, that's my, that's my question. I, I Does didn't. anyone have that? I mean, I think Stuart makes a good point. It's like, it's one thing to say, we acknowledge and recognize and will not tolerate racism in all its forms. But does anybody on this call actually have experiences, either your own or people you know, in this town of, yes. of racism? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen it. I've seen it in our community. Um, so I, I will I will acknowledge that I've seen uh, racist comments uh, thrown out to individuals, not from me, but from others um, in the community. So but that, that would but be that is crazy not, that's not, not, the, not to include that, But that's, that's not what it says. It says that all these various ways in which racism can occur. And, you know, they're, 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 I mean, they're, I've, I've been reading up on this because I... This is not something I'm an expert on. I, I wanted to read up so that I felt like I could understand these concepts and, and have a meaningful response to this, this policy. And, you know, they, they, they bring up many examples of where this is occurring in many other places. And 
you know, these are these are things we should condemn and we should be village, vigilant about that they're not occurring here. But I mean, for example, okay, well, I don't Andy, see Andy saying us he, putting he, a mar- we, we we don't we, we're not putting a marginalised community into a into a toxic area of our community because of our policies. You know, we're not we're not we're not doing these things right now. And and, and this and, and this policy says we do that we recognise it. And well, that's, that's just not like the case. Andy, it sounds like Andy does recognize that. I'm going to go to Janice and then Dirk. My, uh, I think this is uh, a policy that we should have on the books. I'm happy to see it up. Um, my, only, uh, my only suggestion was that on page 69 under definitions and bias, it says bias is often formed without reasonable justification. That's kind of the definition of having a bias. It doesn't have a reasonable de- justification. I think we can actually take that little bit of that sentence out and the, and the, um, the definition will still be as accurate and uh, as fulsome as it needs to be. So are you suggesting just take out often formed without reasonable justification? That is what I'm suggesting. Right. Okay, that sounds good. Take that out. Okay, so um, I, wanna, I wanna add in what Dirk said under roles and responsibilities and then go back to what Stuart's talking about because I don't think we finished that. So Dirk, you had something to add under roles and responsibilities about, about um, take, it's, your, your thing was, seemed like it was more proactive. So yeah, how would you I, I think, word that and where do you want it? I think under, uh, there were roles and responsibilities, if I remember correctly, for council members and management and employees. And I, yep, I think page 70, page 70. Yeah, I, I think in each of those or an overall one, I do think we have the responsibility to be anti-racist. I, I do I do see racism, maybe not the big putting, you know, people to look different of us in toxic places, but there's every day, every job site, every time you're you're out, um, you, you hear the small, and it's our responsibility to call them out, like someone commenting on the China virus or uh, it, those little transgressions make the bigger transgressions more acceptable. And I think as a society, we need to do more and better. And I do think there is systemic racism here. And, okay. and that's oh, a much it. longer conversation, but I- Okay, can you put that, do you, what, let's just put it into a, a phrase there. Do you want to say take yeah. a, be proactively anti-racist? Does that, does that yeah. work? Okay, so you would add yeah. that under the roles and responsibilities. Yeah, I think that just goes, and then I, I did really like that, uh, that um, diagram that Elma sent out. And I think that gets us into kind of that third part of the bubble, the, the, the proactive and... Yeah, yeah I and think I that's an important one. I just that on my phone and even though it was sent to council, I'm still not getting things that go to council. If it just goes to council, I don't get it. So I didn't get, uh, there was something else I didn't get, but anyway. Okay, so now, so we've got, we've got that. Um, does, does anybody want to- Can I just note, the, 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 can I just yeah. note on that, on, on Dirk's point there, that yeah. the, the, our roles and responsibilities are to promote and foster the principles of this policy. You know, I mean, that, 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 that's not exactly the same wording that you're using, Dirk, but it does get to the same point. I'm not uh, sure that it actually does. But... Uh, well, no? Well, I mean, the principles seem pretty, pretty, pretty aren't they? And, I mean, I think Dirk's is more Promote and foster? Promote, fo- no? support, promote, foster, as opposed to proactively be anti-racist. I don't know, it's up, it's up to you guys. Uh, I, think it's, I think it's subtle, but I think it's important. Uh, I do think it's different. You can foster people coming together, but you, you, you do need to call out the anti-racist or the racist part. You have to be active in that. It's not good enough to bring people together. It's you gotta call out but still trying to take them apart. That's Stuart, my view. Are you against including it? No, I'm not. Okay. Well, let, let's include it. I'm and not then against let's, it. Let's go back to the part where uh, back on the front page, number one, City of Roslyn acknowledges and recognizes the existence in our community of racism in all its forms. So I think Stuart had some suggestions about language there. I mean, actually, you know what? I mean, I honestly, I, 
I'm not sure that I would recognize it in all its form in our community. I recognize it in all its form in the world for sure. And I don't want to tolerate it if it were in our community. But to say that I recognize the existence in our community of all of these forms of racism, it doesn't feel factual to me either. I want, to, I want, the, I want the statement there, but maybe just... Uh, can we can we say the city of Roslyn recognizes or acknowledges and recognizes racism in all its forms, including cultural, environmental, institutional, systemic, and individual, and leave out the existence in our community? Or do some of you feel that? What about what about and what about and is committed to not tolerating them or something to that effect? Acknowledges, recognizes, and will not tolerate racism in all its forms. How do people feel about that? Uh, Janice is saying yes, Chris is saying yes, Andy's saying yes, and Dirk is saying no. What, Dirk? No. I, I, for me, I, there's, there's no way. I have a fairly average bubble of people, and within that bubble of people, there are off-color jokes. There are, there are transgressions in this, and I think that given where we are, I, uh, there's no way I could say that it doesn't exist in our community, and I think Given human we're not, nature, we're, we're not at. saying that. Yeah, that's not what it's no. saying. We're not, we're not saying that, Dirk. But, but I, I would suggest that the likelihood of it existing in our community is greater than the likelihood that it doesn't exist. So I think that acknowledging that it exists here and actively trying to stamp it out, I think that's okay. Okay, how about message. this? How about the city of Roslyn acknowledges and rec rec acknowledges, recognizes, and will not tolerate the existence in our community of racism in all its form. Well, that's it. Cynthia, you got that? Okay, okay. How about that? Are we good with that? Say, say that one more time so we can clearly okay. capture it. The, the city of Roslyn acknowledges, recognizes, and will not tolerate, and then the rest of it's the same. Thank so you. we're just acknowledges, recognizes, and will not tolerate the existence in our community of racism in all its forms, et cetera, et cetera. How about that? Okay, anything, anything else with those changes, anything else on this policy? Stu, you have your hand up? No, sorry. No? Okay, that's all right. Uh, Dirk, you have your hand up? Oh, no. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call the question then. We've made a couple little changes that are significant, I think, um, and Cynthia has them. And we're gonna call the question, all in favor? All in favor, everybody good. Okay, good, thank you. Um, hey, let's talk about cannabis retail store again. No, let's not. Let's go to the development variance permit for 2510 Georgia. So this is a reduced setback from four to 0.3. Got a mover for that. The staff recommendation is that we approve it. Uh, Dirk says yes, who seconds? Jana seconds. Okay, any discussion on this? This seems reasonable. Okay, Janice, any comments? Nope. Okay, I'm going to call the question. All in favor? Can I, can I just... Oh, yes. Yes, sorry. We didn't vote. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, it seems like for these situations, normally we, we try and get something. It, was there nothing we wanted to get out of this? There's no storage requirements or any sort of concessions that we were able to get for, for this, providing this benefit to this resident? No, we didn't need any. Okay. Look at that. We give without taking. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, so um, with that, I'm just gonna let the vote stand because you, everyone voted for it, right? We're all good? Okay, now we're on to the replacement of the arena brine chiller and condenser, the tender review and award. Darren, this is your chance to shine. Um, we did have a few questions on this, but let's get a motion on the table first. But he moves it, moves something. Dirk moves it, Chris seconds it. Um, okay, so Dirk, you wanna comment? I think I just had a question that echoed another one that I saw about the SCADA. Okay, well, let's ask it. SCADA. Do we need it or is this, like, do we not have one now? Is this going to be safer? Okay, so, yeah, so right now, no, we don't have any SCADA. So SCADA is going to give us uh, 
would give us the ability to uh, have uh, real-time monitoring of the uh, system. So it'll also give us, um, it would also give us trends of the uh, compressors of the of of everything that's in there because it'll uh, it'll trend it all onto a uh, onto a um, through the software onto our computer. Um, it'll also be the call out procedure so that if um, if something went wrong, then it would uh, it would automatically call out through a a cycle of whatever the inputs we put in there as phone numbers. Um, so yes, it is a benefit for for uh, short term and long term um, um, gauging of the equipment, and also gives us that extra added protection of um, of callouts. And plus, you can do things remotely as well. Um, you could log into your computer to make changes to the brine temperature. Um, you know, you, you, we could uh, we would cut back on on um, on holidays. Um, of um, not sending somebody over there um, uh, on on weekends on um, when there's nobody uh, manning the plant because we could physically uh, go on the computer and and see what's going on. Um, we wouldn't have to have our operator go over there in the mornings when our arena doesn't open till noon because they can just log on in the morning and ensure that everything is 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 running well. Uh, so it gives us that benefit. Right now, yes, we do have a call out. It only calls out if the brine temperature um, gets above a certain set temperature, then it will uh, it will phone Selkirk Securities and just tell us that there's an alarm going off over there. And also, as well as with, with the uh, ammonia alarm, it would also call out now. So is it a is it a must have? No, it's not a must have. Is it a nice to have? Most definitely is it something it's something that would be good to have for future um, training of the uh, compressors for uh, for efficiencies and whatnot. Well, good, Gans. Darren, will it will it tell us? Uh, will the SCAD uh, SCADA system tell us um, how much energy? Like, will it give give us a report on how much energy we used through the system or the plant over the course of the season, so we can do some analysis with it? It would not, uh, that would not be one of the inputs that was, uh, that is, is scheduled to be put in. Yes, that could definitely be put in to, uh, to link it up to see what the energy uh, consumption is. Do you have any idea oh, what you, that would cost? You mean for the extra input, you mean? Yeah. Um, no, I don't. I mean, in our, in our effort to be energy conservationists here, it would be kind of good information to have. Janice, sorry. Well, sorry, with everything that's going in with this system is totally energy uh, energy efficient um, from what we uh, currently are at. That's great. I was just going to ask Darren if he knew if um, any of these inputs, I mean, as we go along and as times change, there may be other things that we want to know about our system and efficiencies and energy use, et cetera, et cetera. Um, is it a system that can be uh, updated or we can add inputs to in the future in a fairly, it's, it sounds like it's a computer uh, computer system or a computer app that measures things on the system. Uh, are we able to add inputs to it in the future? Yes, definitely. So I, I mean, the reason I, it's it's very similar system to what we use at the water treatment plant. So, you know, if you buy a, a system with, you know, with, uh, with 16 inputs, then you can always add on to it at a, at a later time. Right. Um, let's see, any other questions? Chris? Um, Darren, is there a, an annual fee for the SCADA system um, over and above the purchase of the software and the hardware? Oh, yes, there is. There is, uh, I don't know what that cost is, Chris. It's fairly minimal. It's something that I didn't okay. even bother putting in into here because it would just go under our operational budget. Okay, thanks. Andy? A quick question, why it wasn't um, uh, put in the original budget, the SCADA system? Why it was not put in there? Mm -hmm. You mean in, when we did our Class D estimates, you mean? It was all part and parcel of it. But it's, as, as time went along here, we've, we've just tried to break things out as much as we can to give uh, a cost of, um, you know, the, the, the absolutely must and then the nice to have. So. 
when they do their uh, when when we originally did our budgeting, it uh, it it would have included that. It just it didn't break it out. Okay. Um, I had a question on on the option one. There, could you um, give us a little more detail about the hundred and thirty thousand? Um, are these necessary upgrades? Are they? Can, what happens if we don't do them? You know that kind of. Yeah, they're not they're not nice to haves. They're must haves. It's okay. it's part and parcel of the of the whole system. For uh, there's there's components in there that um, don't meet, uh, of course, work safe requirements. You don't have enough working space in between one machine to another. Um, our we've got uh, materials combustible materials in the uh, in the equipment room that need to go. Uh, we need to ensure that it's got one hour fire rating. Yeah, so no, it's it's all. And and with your email there, I I went through it and no, there's there's nothing that's a nice to have. It's a must okay, have. Okay, that's perfect. Yeah. That's all I need to know. Okay, yeah. so what we really need to have on this on this uh, uh, um, motion is: Are we going for option one or are we going for option two, which includes option one? So, uh, yeah, Stuart. Yeah, I um, I guess to decide on this, I just would ask Darren in your you know, best judgment over the lifetime of this 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 uh, system is the fifty thousand dollars we would spend now. Is that going to are the efficiencies going to more than pay back the fifty thousand dollars over the life of the system? No. No, I think that's easy to answer, um, Stuart. It's uh, it's not going to pay back, but it's going to give us the ability to monitor. Um, and, and, you know, do future trends. That's, that's, that's what it's going to give us. Well, and better, yeah, the better warning system, I think is, is important. Yeah. But if we're looking at dollars for payback, then no, it, it's not there, but that, um, yeah. that was the intent of it. Yeah. Uh, okay. Chris. How much of the 130 is uh, contingency do you think? Uh, it's about $43,000. Okay. And will the, um, SCADA system give us a savings on insurance? No. And what, and how about warranty? No. No. Okay. Okay. So right now we have the motion that we award the replacement in the amount of $435,000 plus applicable taxes, etc. So we do have to decide whether we're doing option one or option two. So who made the motion first? Dirk, was that you? Dirk, I think you, did you make it? Who made it? I don't remember. Might have been me. My hand's been all over the place. I, I think it was you <laughs> and I think, and I think uh, Chris seconded it. So do you want to... <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. It's a family show here. Um, <laughs> Uh, so do you want to add whether you, whether you want option one or option two into your motion? Or well, I'd like, do this and then uh, go back and say we want option one or option two. No, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, am I on? Yeah, I'm happy to add option two. I like data. I like knowing how something is running. And if we're able to streamline staff a little bit, maybe we don't save money on the running down to check it out, but you know, at the same time, we get more done because they're not running down to check it out. So yeah. okay. I like option two. Okay, so uh, Chris, you were the seconder. Are you okay with adding option two in there? Well, I am. I have one more question though. Um, so if we didn't use up our contingency and we decided to go with option one and then decided to purchase the SCADA down the road once we realize value engineering or savings on the, on the other side, could we buy it down the road? Yes. Yeah, it could be added. There's, so I went through this with them to, cause I thought maybe this question would come up. Yes, it can be ordered at a, I, we'll know three quarters into the project, how our contingency is doing. Um, I, I'm, I'm wishful in saying that I hope we don't use a lot of it. Um, so I would say three quarters into the project, we should know that. And yes, we could continue on even if we use 20,000 of the contingency and we have 20,000, you know, or $25,000 left to go towards the SCADA, um, that would be, you know, of course, another option. Okay, Dirk, does that change anything you want to do with your motion? 
No. Okay. And uh, Janice. Uh, will if we add it later, will it will it change the cost? Um, no, because the inputs will still. Uh, it it depends how far into it we do it. We make the changes. Then yes, it could add a little bit of additional cost. So if we waited, if we waited a year and did it, we would probably add additional costs. If we wait yes. till we're three quarters the way through and we realize that we haven't used a bunch of our contingency, so we have some space, it probably wouldn't add any additional costs. I and I don't know those numbers, Janice. It, you know, it might be it might be you know fairly uh, fairly small in additional costs, even if we did wait. I can't. I don't know. That also. Mm -hmm. And, and probably, we're keeping, probably at minimal, it would be the cost of getting the guy out to install it. Yeah, it's a different guy, though. It's um, the person that would install the SCADA is um, is a different company than the than the general contractor. And Darren, this uh, chiller, this whole project we're doing, what's the lifespan of it? Twenty years. Twenty years. And what's the lifespan of a SCADA, SCADA system? Well, the water treatment plant, for example. We've had to do an upgrade to it um, after about 15 years. Okay, we have a motion on the table to- Remember the, re remember the water meters. <laughs> remember the water meters. Uh, uh, no. no, no, get rid of the water meters. Uh, okay, so we have a motion on the table that is uh, going forward with this tender and option two, and we have a seconder, and we have no further comments, so all in favor? I mean, I, I'd, I mean, I, can I just make, well, yes. whatever. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. You I mean, I'd, I just make, I, 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 I would prefer to, you know, it doesn't sound like we're going to save any money with this system. I mean, it's, you know, this is the, the great option. Um, you know, if we have money available in the contingency, it seems like it would be a, a luck, you know, a, a nice thing to have, but it's $50,000 for, you know, having more data. It's, a, it's not, a, not a small amount of money. I don't know whether I want to be just flipping about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Andy. I would uh, I would propose that we make uh, uh, an amendment to the motion that we hold off on approving uh, number two tonight, and let's give the flexibility to, for staff to come back to us um, once the project's uh, in a uh, in its as Darren says about three quarters of the way in. Um, and we can uh, look at the budget, see what, where things are at at that point. Okay, Darren? Um, this is probably more question for Brian, but um, is there a way I would prefer not come back to council, but if, if we were to say that if less than 50% of the contingency is used, then we go ahead with the SCADA. Um, is that is that difficult to make it that go that way, Brian? Because I just know in, when I get into the project, and then all of a sudden you make that determination, and there's not a council meeting for another two weeks. You know, there might be a bit of a of an issue there. Yeah, or a month as we go into the summer when we only have yeah. one in yeah. July and one in August. Yeah, uh, Brian, do you see? I'd, I'd be com I'd be comfortable with that. Yeah, me too, Brian. Uh, well, from a staff perspective, we'll be, we're even with including the SCADA system and the components there, we're under the um, allocated budget for the year. So, you know, we would sit down and say that if we would we would go, we would obviously make a further decision on this, and then we would keep council informed of that decision. But I would I would suggest that we just go ahead and 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 go with that SCADA system unless there's a significant unforeseen circumstances that happen that we use up all of our contingency. That would mostly be like an operational activity from, from Darren and from Scott. Okay, so why don't we just keep with the motion that we've got with the understanding that if it starts to get pricey and you start to use up all of that, all of that contingency, it'll be an operational decision to say, no, we're gonna skip the SCADA. We, we want it if we can afford it, and we, we don't want it if we can't. Can we, can we do that? And just, leave, staff, staff understands our thinking about this, and we can go forward, okay? Yeah, I'm good with that. Okay, I'm gonna call the question, unless anybody else has anything. I see no little blue hands, all in favor. Okay, good, yeah, good, that'll be nice. Okay, on to traffic calming, the calm part of our evening. Traffic calming and road safety improvements on Thompson. 
So uh, the staff recommendation is that council approves the attached map and proposed changes to help calm traffic and reduce speeds on Thompson. So do we have a mover for this or something else? Janice. I'll move this. Okay, and a seconder? <laughs> Andy seconds. Okay, discussion, Janice. Yeah, I know we've gotten a couple of uh, I know we've gotten a couple of letters about this. I've also because I live on Thompson and I walk up and down the street and around the area with my dog every day. I've had a number of conversations with some of my neighbors. Um, I did have a couple of questions about the structures, whether or not they will be um, permanent to start with, or they're just a seasonal structure. Um, I don't see a problem with a stop sign on Washington, given that we have a stop sign at the top of Spokane, going on to Columbia, which is also a steep hill, probably even a steeper hill than that. Uh, I did think we should probably talk to the residents of Lower Esling before we, uh, before, to make sure that they generally use that road in the direction that Darren has uh, indicated. So I don't see that as being a problem, but certainly it would be uh, worthwhile just to reach out. I think there's six houses that have driveways, six or seven houses that have driveways onto that street. Um, I don't like the idea of putting this off and not trying this because um, I hear multiple stories about people walking with their kids and strollers and their family and people driving straight at them and then getting out and, you know, when they make the slow down motion, getting out and yelling obscenities at them. And I'm not willing, this has been an ongoing issue as many of our areas are with traffic. I'm not willing to put this off until somebody gets hurt or there's a fatality um, because people are inconvenienced by having to go slower in their cars. Okay. Uh, Stuart, were you the seconder? Who was I was. The, oh, Andy, then Stuart. So uh, this... Uh, is in my neighborhood as well, of course, and on Washington, living on Washington Street, uh, just below Thompson. And um, I certainly have had a number of uh, conversations with the neighbors affected uh, by it. Uh, the general consensus is people are, are pretty pleased with the idea of having some kind of traffic calming on Thompson Avenue. Big challenge for uh, residents that live down on Lower Washington is the intersection, uh, the, the approach up to Thompson and the fact that the yield sign that was there previously is now gonna be a stop sign and that's gonna be a real challenge for winter time. And, um, and Janice, just, uh, just your point about Spokane, it, it is actually steeper than Spokane, it's shorter and steeper. Um, so you, you don't have the same time to, to accelerate up the hill. And if you have to stop, uh, there's lots of times that you can't start again. Um, another good point that came up was uh, the fact that um, we have neighbors on Thompson that, that park vehicles uh, on, on the boulevard and we, we have poor sight lines. So um, the idea of narrowing the street actually may, may allow us to uh, be further out on Thompson and see, see better traffic flow uh, coming down uh, from either direction. But certainly um, important, I think, to consult with our community down here, our neighborhood. Uh, as pointed out in a, in a couple of letters, there's, there's a number of people impacted. The traffic is anticipated to increase uh, when Redstone is, is uh, required to put the uh, second uh, access point from the golf course um, up Queen Street. Uh, that's going to substantially increase the traffic flow uh, up Washington onto Thompson. So I think we really do have to look seriously at at that as well and I don't know how long that is down the road but um, I understand we're getting closer to that. Okay, Stuart. Yeah I mean I've been people can be complaining about this as long as I've lived here and I think it's about time we do something about it um, and I think every time we we consider putting traffic coming measures in place people complain about it I know they you know everyone was complaining about all the 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 things we put in place up on on Washington and uh, that seems to be working out just fine. So um, I say go for it. Okay, Dirk. I think as you may or may not be aware, I am quite behind slowing traffic down and uh, fully behind this. I also <laughs> think that uh, based on my observations in town, 
the uh, park in Columbia, the yield signs seem to indicate accelerate and stop signs throughout most of the time, towns seem to indicate yield anyway. So um, I think people will use good judgment. And if they think they're gonna slide on backwards, then uh, you know, they'll accelerate. And if they think they're gonna get tagged by somebody doing 32 kilometers an hour, then they'll stop at the top. So I, I think it's a bit moot. I am all for slowing traffic down. Okay. Janice. I was just gonna address the, uh, the yield versus stop sign. It is a four way uncontrolled intersection. So in theory, everyone's supposed to stop before they go through it. <laughs> yeah, and that happens. <laughs> I did say in theory. <laughs> in theory, yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, okay, so has there been any conversation with the people on, on Esling about, about the one way there? So I, I can answer that. I don't um, know there has not been, but I think maybe there's a, a, a misunderstanding. So what, what's going to happen is at the bottom of Esling, it's going to say a no through road. And then once you get past Laura's driveway, that's where it's going to say, do not enter. So Laura and everybody else will be able to access their driveways um, from down below, or they'll be able to come off of Thompson. Oh, okay. So it's not going to have any impact on them as oh, far. Okay. As, but when that's, you come out of that intersection, it's horrible. That's brilliant, Darren. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, because the way the driveways are built that you have to, you know, you need to come up in order to turn into them. So we couldn't make it just a straight one way. So it's, it's not going to be a do not enter sign there. It's just going to be no through way at the, at bottom. the bottom. It's going to say no through way. And after Laura's driveway, it's going to be do not enter. Okay. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I didn't get that. Okay. Perfect. That's wonderful. Um, is the photo that's in the back there, is that an accurate representation of what we're talking about initially? Mm, that's the best I could find. <laughs> no, it's not, it's not, it's not great. It's the, it, those are the type of pylons that we, uh, that we're proposing to, to be used. Um, they're just, and, and they bolt into the, uh, they bolt into the, into the asphalt surface so that, uh, you know, they can't be moved around. Um, and yet, you know, if we're finding that there's legitimate concerns once we put them in, you know, yes, we can we can unbolt them and, and move them around, you know, with a, with a little bit of work. Um, the intent is that they stay permanently. I think Janice had asked that. There'll be a summertime, wintertime use. Um, uh, a concern. There, there, uh, wait a minute. There will be. They'll they'll be taken out in winter. No, no. they'll no. stay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Um, okay. Our concern there, and um, I had, a, I don't know if you guys seen the email from Bev Thomas today, but um, she was concerned rightfully, and we, we did uh, look into that, is allowing um, traffic to still, or sorry, pedestrians to still walk through the cones so they're not going out into the bump outs. And so, yes, we did consider that. The, the trickiest part there is not on Washington, it's on um, Spokane, where we have <clears throat> curb lines that we have to deal with. So we're looking into figuring out how we're going to do that. Okay. So when these things are just bolted into the asphalt, there's not actually a curb that's going to be installed. It's nope. so, yeah. So people could walk through. Yes. There wouldn't be a problem for them to walk through. Yeah. Not at all. No, no. And, no, and we don't, at this time, we don't have to worry about drainage or anything like that because it'll just drain around them um, and go in the ways that they do now. Um, and, and Andy to, to, to um, try to satisfy the residents down there. So you're, you're not supposed to have a mixed um, yield sign and stop sign at an intersection. It's either you have both stops or both yields um, and having um, not stopping traffic there was highly recommended against from, um, from David Dean, the ICBC uh, traffic uh, specialist. So we're trying to push that stop sign out as far as we can onto Thompson Avenue, because as you mentioned, the sight lines are, are better the further out we can get because of, well, first of all, trees, but then cars and stuff, um, especially when you're looking west. So it's, um, we're trying, and also it does flatten out up there a bit. I'm not saying it'll be perfect, um, but you know, that's, we're trying to keep that in consideration when we're moving these things around. It actually could be better than it is right now. 
because when you, if you're able to move that stop sign out, there will be, I mean, I, I went through there and drove, you know, drove all those and you do kind of come to a flat. I mean, it's bad if you've got two cars behind you, they're going to be on the steep. But, yeah. So the other thing, and I imagine this is not possible, but I, I was thinking, well, could we sort of offset them a bit? So you almost do get a little chicane going through there a little bit. If you push them out on one side and out the other way on the, on the other side, um, so when well, the car comes well, down comps and it has to, it, it goes towards, you know, goes, it goes towards the uphill side of the street and then, and then around kind of realigning, but not really realigning, just kind of make a little, a little snake. So the issue there is having that stop sign coming down Washington street. We're trying to get that one out as far as we can so that you have a bit of a flatter area to stop in the winter time. So it, it's a, it's a double edged sword there. Yeah. Okay. Okay, well, you know what? I love seeing this and, and the fact that it's kind of a low cost pilot too. And eventually maybe we can put more, you know, actually make it like it is on, on Washington, right? And put actual concrete bumps in there. Uh, Chris and then Andy. Um, did we discuss traffic circles at all? There's no room. Yeah. yeah. No room. No room. No. Andy. Uh, Dare, will, will uh, Washington be noticeably narrower than Washington itself? Um, you mean coming up onto Thompson, you mean, Andy? Yeah. Um, b basically what you see there, no, it, it's not, it doesn't narrow much more. Okay. Oh, so uh, the cones, when they were originally placed, were moved within 24 hours. So uh, I don't exactly know what, um, what uh, okay. yeah, well, but... Um, point two point two. It'll be 7.2 at the, uh, at the minimum. Okay, so it is going to be narrowed then, uh, substantially. It is going to be narrowed somewhat, yep. Yeah, uh, there's, going to be, there's going to be quite a kick, but a pushback from our, our neighborhood down here about that, for sure. So I've already heard that there's concerns about... What's uh, the and, 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 narrow and it's, and it's, uh, The right-hand turn, um, that people have to come up um, and, and tuck, stay, stay tight to the right side. Um, that's the issue uh, that that seems to be. And again, win winter time is is the challenge. Most people leaving here, uh, commuting to work, are turning right onto Thompson. Um, not as many going left. So uh, wanting to be able to to stay wide on on that right hand turn. Uh, if you have to go out into the street, then you're actually going into the other lane. Um, if you're turning right. So th there's the concern. And again, maybe that's, maybe that's a good thing because people have to slow down and, and watch for oncoming traffic more and wait their turn. That's the idea. Um, I mean, people yeah. do it on Washington street all the way up to Plumen way. And we haven't had any accidents, you know, and it's, that's the sight lines there, as you know, are even yeah. worse than it is going to be on Thompson and the traffic's higher. Yeah. We have to keep in mind the problem we're trying to solve. The problem we're trying to solve is getting people to slow down. And I think this, you know, I, we haven't had yeah. anything better, <laughs> any better ideas to make this happen. So, you know, I think it's, I think it's great. And, well, and I like if, the, if it's a huge disaster, right? If it's a huge disaster, we can unbolt them and, and start over again with something else. Tax on the highway or tomatoes on windshields. Well, that's, yeah, idea. But any, uh, we'll I like the idea that there is going to be flexibility there. Yes, and we will take that into concern. We'll have a better look at, at down there too. Yeah, because I know plowing in the winter as well. It, it'll be up. Uh, I'm, I'm sure your guys, your operators, are going to have, have some input as well because they have a certain pattern the way they like to plow things down here. So, well, their input would be input put too. anything up. You know, that's unfortunately, you know, like when Washington <laughs> Street went on. As far as from an operational um, perspective. Of course, they're a nightmare, but you know, we, they've worked out okay, but I, it's just getting used to it, that's yeah. all. Well, you could say the same thing for the residents, right? It's, it's gonna be, take them sure. a little bit to get okay. used to it too, but uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. any more comments on this? And call the question, we approve the attached map as is with all the wonderful improvements. And thank you, Darren, this has been great. Andy, are you voting opposed? Oh, are, are, are you opposed? No. In favor? Okay. You're muted. I have no idea. Um, okay. Uh, on to the next. Community Energy Association membership that Roslyn Council supports. Community Energy Association directs staff to register as associate member of the organization. Do I have a mover? 
Anybody, Dirk and Andy? Okay. Uh, um, any comments? We've kind of been taking advantage of their good graces for quite some time. Um, uh, I think. Yeah. Look, I, I think they've done some great things that help us facilitate the transition by being able to take our electric cars out of town. Uh, I think that. Yeah, I think we'd benefit from participating. Yeah. Okay, Andy. Anything? Same. Okay. I think their I think their uh, contribution, especially to the Kootenays, has been phenomenal, and I'd like to see us continue to support them with financial as well. Yeah. Well, this will be our first time supporting them at all, so that's that's good. Okay. Anybody else want to speak? Okay. All in favor? In favor? Okay. Stuart, are you in? Janice, you're in. Okay. Okay. Now this is fun. The downtown open air bazaar staff recommendation that we do that for july and august dirk moves it who's a seconder chris is a seconder okay dirk you want to comment I'd like, yeah i'd like to move it with one tweak there was a there was a suggestion for uh vending costs and the like and also the worry that it would turn into a bit of a flea market and i think we just is there a way that we could limit participation of that to businesses that hold a city of ross on business license yeah i would imagine or, or a valid vendor like a market you know i don't i don't know what they need to sell at a farm market but if they had a business license from rossland or a uh, you know market license whatever that might right. be okay christy's going to comment on that i think that the insurance questions that were asked earlier might just do that for you naturally the fact that they have to obtain insur insurance if they don't already have it uh, and name the city as additional insured on that policy might weed out the concerns that you have or the people that might be of concern to you. Is that good, Dirk? Yeah, I, th I just thought it was an opportunity to maybe get a bit more buy-in for the city licenses, business licenses as well. Although I would imagine everybody down there has one. Yeah, it was just a, in a really, really the, the way it is proposed here is really an attempt to make it as simple and easy and uncomplicated as possible to allow an outdoor space as a quick fix here to something that's missing this summer as well as the COVID pandemic for our businesses. Yeah, nice to do something to support businesses. Chris, you were the seconder. Do you have comments? Nope. I nope. think it's X. Um, I, think, uh, I think we will be faced with um, people just wanting to come in and sell their wares like a like a typical flea market but I also think that uh, charging them might limit the amount of creativity that we see okay Janice I was just gonna say Christy did a great job of uh, answering my email I was the one who asked about you know vendor payments and uh, and uh, restricting it uh, somewhat. Um, and she suggested that they could put in a clause about, uh, you know, vendors needed to be approved by the Recreation and Events Department. And I think that's a, I think that's a good way to just make sure that uh, we have the right mix and, and that we don't end up with a flea market type uh, situation on our hands. People actually have to ask permission to come and play. Yeah. yeah Christy, that. Christy, is, that, uh, is that burdensome to you or is that okay? Um, no, no, that's good because I wouldn't, I, I would need them to pre-register in order to give them a location and have them sign the agreement anyhow. So it's, it's not a turn up at the last minute thing at all. Perfect. That's great. Stuart. Yeah, you know, I think these things are fun when there's lots of people there. So I think we should have as few barriers as possible. And, you know, if there's a bunch of junk there, I don't care. I mean, people, people like browsing through junk and weird stuff that's the character of these things you okay know, well if they let's, can let's get, get them all let's, let's, let's fill it up you know, nothing, worse, nothing worse than going to a market when there's any like a few sort of stingy little stalls yeah if they can get insurance they can sell whatever junk they want sure. okay i'm gonna call the question on this all in favor okay thank you uh, okay, a, uh, that the invoices for may check register report be approved who's going to move it Somebody, Janice, Andy, any discussion, any questions for Elma, who's been sitting there patiently, just waiting for your questions? Nobody has any? All in favor? Okay, we're all good. Okay, uh, okay, these are our reports for council information. Let me know if you have any questions or comments on any of them. And you gotta like raise your hand and put your little blue hand up. 
building permit inspection activity for 2020. Uh, building permit report. Uh, public works report. Okay. Oh, well, I did have a question. You know, I know you guys walked around and looked for places we could add, add benches and tables around, around town. Was, was there any um, result of that from public works? Or from Brian? I uh, know right now we're just basically looking at doing an inventory. And then part of the thing is that we have to sit down, we're still figuring out, I don't think we have enough. We obviously have to buy some extra tables and chairs. And so that was a possible amendment in regards to talking to tourism rolls and to amend our RDS strategy to help maybe get some of that funding covered through resort municipality initiatives. So that's ongoing. Okay. All right. Just wasn't sure where it was. Stuart. Yeah. I was just curious how, um, the volume of material that, that was put out for spring cleanup compared to previous years. It, it appeared to be quite a lot, but I don't know. Uh, Darren, you're muted. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, yeah, it, um, I believe the numbers top of my head were 230 loads this year. And I think compared to 190 or something last year. Wow. Great. Yep. Fill up that hugo culture. Oh, it's, it is. Yeah. Okay. Um, how about questions on water production report? Nothing? Or how about updated task list? Okay. Oh, man. We are charging along here now. Um, request from Rawlson Council Arts and Culture to host the CAM Camp Workshop. The staff recommendation is that we approve it. Do we have a mover? Dirk moves it, a seconder. Stuart, okay, any comments? Hi, right, it's cool. Yeah, good. Anything, Stuart? It seemed totally reasonable to me. Okay, great. I'd love to see the video when it's done. All in favor? Okay, good. All right, members reports. Janice, you're up. I should be used to this after two years, but I'm still always surprised when you call me first. Oh, well, next time I'll try to remember not to. It's okay. okay. Uh, I met with the Kootenai Boundary Division of Family Physicians to further discuss business planning and possibilities around enhanced community, community care provisions in Rossland. Uh, I met with the Recreation Task Force to work on information gathering and reporting parameters for the final portion of the task force's current work, which is the DRB. Uh, attended a CBAL, which is the Columbia Basin Alliance for Literacy meeting, uh, to plan the 2020 goals and programs, review the 2019 successes, and determine best steps to move forward in our current health environment. Um, and surprisingly, a lot of the programs are very well subscribed and have moved on to online uh, and technology uh, solutions. But there are some real technology um, barriers as well, especially for some of the lower income families where, you know, you say, well, we'll just send you this and you can print it out. And they go, well, I don't have a printer or you can't send it to me. I don't have access, regular access to a computer. I usually go to the library. So, so there are some um, technology issues. Uh, it's been amazing and it's been a barrier at the same time. Um, attended a BC Economic Development Association webinar with uh, Minister Michelle Mungal and economic development professionals throughout the province of BC to learn what's working for other jurisdictions, what steps the BC government is considering for future relaxation of health orders, and how we might support our local businesses through that process. It was very interesting. Uh, I did attend the Black Lives Matter demonstration in Rawson. I was very impressed with the engagement of our community and particularly our youth and who are our future uh, regarding this important social issue. So it was great to see that many people out. Uh, and I met casually with a board member of KCTS to discuss growth and sustainability in our community region and how that supports the continuation of all our cherished, diminished, cherished amenities, services, and facilities in Rawson for the for foreseeable future. And because it was a KCTS member, we drank beer while we did that. It was really great. I'll meet with any of them. <laughs> That's it. That's what I got. Good. Okay, Stuart. I got nothing to report. 
well, come on, you met about trails with me and Stacy and Scott. Oh yeah, I did do that. But I, is, it, is that do I, do I report about that here? <laughs> I can t- I can talk endlessly about all the things going on with trails, <laughs> but I just bore you all. That's okay. Uh, okay, Andy. Uh, my report was submitted last week for the meetings for May uh, in uh, Regional District Kootenai Boundary. Um, any questions uh, anybody has about uh, things that were uh, printed in there, welcome to ask. Um, thankfully, uh, the situation of the flooding seems to be um, reducing the stress on staff and management at uh, the RDKB, although uh, just a week and a half ago, of course, they had a, an incident over in uh, the Boundary uh, Grant Forks area once again. So still, still a risk there. Uh, I actually thought after the, the, uh, this previous weekend and last couple of thunderstorms that we've experienced here in uh, Roslyn that we might be in an EOC uh, situation. So we had some pretty wicked storms. And I would like to say thanks to, um, to Darren and crew and Scott for uh, the efforts of uh, Public Works to do um, uh, remediate some of the problems that occurred around the community. Uh, down in our neighborhood, we lost uh, one of the secondary roads down here, practically washed all the way down to Queen Street. So uh, there were issues. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know if there were any questions specifically about the report. Um, upcoming meetings include uh, East End Services tomorrow and uh, an inaugural meeting, uh, which I'm chairing for um, curbside pickup throughout the uh, East End services. So it's kind of cool that finally uh, the reality of having um, compost, uh, street side compost is, is becoming uh, closer. And now uh, we're going to be talking as, as a community, as a region within the East End services about uh, the actual logistics of getting organized with curbside pickup. So I look forward to the ideas that are gonna come out in the discussions. I'll certainly keep council abreast of some of those and see where see where we go in the future. Um, uh, tomorrow is that very first meeting, so it'll be interesting. Well, that's great. Hey, would you make mm-hmm. your um, regional district report available to the media as long as there isn't confidential, you know, in-camera stuff in there? Just because since we don't really talk about it at, at the yeah. meeting, and it's always good to have our media report on it. Uh, That's a very good idea. I will make sure Sarah gets a copy of that. Uh, I don't know if I can also, I don't mind sending it to the Rosin News as well, so I'll do it to both. I can give you the contact of the new guy. Um, Dirk, That'd be you're... great. Dirk? I, uh, yeah, I <laughs> took uh, Wednesday night off of crying myself to sleep every night and attended the library AGM, literally from a van down by a river. And uh, the library is in good financial stead, and they have nine new—not all new, but nine board members from a uh, from a field of eleven. So they actually had a vote um, to get nine new uh, excellent board members in place. Right. So they have a co-chair, two of them, and made some changes. But yeah, they're they're rare and to go, and that's it for me. Good, Chris. I, on June 10th, the uh, Heritage Commission meeting with our local stakeholders here. Um, a discussion of local collaboration with the RCAC Museum and Tourism Ross uh, in donating, developing, and facilitating some events and our volunteers, our cherished volunteers that we, we seem to uh, always be searching for. Um, cooperation on funding avenues and grant applications so we are synergistic with what we ask for uh, instead of all going after the same things um, it was a it was a good inaugural meeting we're working to pivot our associations to work together uh, collaboratively uh, enabling just event coordination and volunteer effectiveness and uh, while working to fit those plans into existing targets and budgets uh, more to follow on that because I think it's going to be a, a pretty successful group. Um, and then also uh, with Janice, I uh, met with the local doctors regarding our community health center. Uh, discussed how a schedule would look. So they're, they're working on, on putting it together, you know, financially as well as uh, um, time-wise. Um, 
working on a draft budget, space requirements, and how it would look uh, if they were to move into our old city hall and, or, or somewhere. And, uh, and they want to look to expand services within that group. So physio and counselors, mental health, et cetera. So it could be a really interesting and viable thing happening down the road. Uh, and that's it for me. That's great. Well, that, that is an exciting uh, possibility. Um, okay, so I've got a few things. Uh, we don't have a firm update on the by-election yet, hopefully in the fall. Um, I want to invite everyone to join me for the grad parade. The grads are going to drive one per grad with a parent or perhaps someone of their bubble in the car with them. And they're going to do a parade that starts at the arena and circles around through Upper Roslyn, goes across first. It doesn't go, it doesn't, it doesn't go on Columbia, so no traffic control required. Um, they're going to do it at just before 2 p.m. on June 27th. And we, uh, city and council, are giving them a little gift, which is a, uh, a coffee mug and a pair of our Roslyn gloves and a, and a pin. But of course, the coffee mug kind of looks like a beer can, so I'm a little concerned about the message we're giving, but the kids are going to love them. Anyway, so any one of you who would like to join me to hand those out, that would be great. It's their socially distanced parade around town. So um, let's see. Okay. Then meetings, all meetings, of course, teleconference or Zoom, 100% renewable meeting, draft is being finalized. Um, the expert groups are being invited and will be meeting. Um, had a meeting with mayors and Minister Robinson and Premier Hogan, Hogan <laughs> to recap local experience with the pandemic. Um, you know, they talked about the provincial response, recoveries. The calls continue to happen every two weeks, usually just with Minister Robinson. Government's been really responsive. I've been very impressed with how they how they dealt with this. Um, there was a meeting with the RMI mayors and Minister Bear, and she's looking for for ways to support tourism. There's it's obviously a huge impact on BC economy. She's well aware, and she's looking for ways government can help. The feds are also looking for ways. Um, and all, basically all of our RMI communities pretty much have the same concerns. Concern about opening too fast, concern about not getting tourists back, opening too slow, long-term economic impact for the pandemic. So everybody's kind of struggling there. Um, there was a meeting with the Eco Society and through the Energy Association and elected, and elected folks in the region to review a really interesting survey about messaging to rural communities outside the Lower Mainland, but including Kelowna and Kamloops. So when talking about climate change, and there were some interesting findings that they that they that the the survey came up with. I, I forget how many people they surveyed, but it was uh, it was quite interesting. They got funding to do two surveys. Um, I'm not sure where they got the funding. It wasn't it wasn't us. It was something else. Um, one they did before the pandemic, and one will occur later. Um, one thing one thing that really struck me is that people preferred the term global warming to climate change, which I I thought was was really kind of interesting because I find that you know. When it's raining out forever and ever, if you talk about global warming, people are going to say it's bullshit. Um, and also that the other thing that was really gratifying is in the rural BC communities um, that people are very open to making changes, especially when it's stated using positive language about new job creation, new skills training, better for kids, that kind of stuff, all the optimistic stuff, as opposed to we're all going to die. Um, so that was important. I attended both the uh, Black Lives Matter rallies, the one in Roslyn and the one in Trail. Good turnout at both. And I agree with Janice. It was really gratifying to see, um, you know, such widespread support for ending systemic racism and also to see the kids so, you know, connected. And also seeing things that are changing with the RCMP starting to review their policies and training and that kind of thing. Uh, Midtown Project, we had another meeting. We reviewed the schedule. We reviewed the responses that the council's questions and we're happy to report that other similar um, BC, BC housing projects have been tendered in the Kootenays and they so far have been coming in under budget. So there appears to be no slowdown in uh, projects going forward or impacts on the supply chains due to the pandemic at this time. Of course that could change, but um, our team is continuing to move the project forward. Um, I had I met the new uh, Roslyn, uh, Roslyn News reporter, Connor Tremblay. He now lives in the Kootenays, and he came and toured Roslyn his first visit, and we spent quite a bit of time together. He got some new stock pictures and met lots of people, so that was good. Um, if anyone has not 
completed the Doodle Poll for the communication workshop we're trying to set up with Wendy Booth, please fill it out. And that's it. Uh, so now we need a motion that our June 15th regular meeting will be closed pursuant to 91A, personal information about an identifiable individual who holds or is being considered for a position as an officer, employee, agent, municipality, or another position appointed by council and 91E, acquisition, disposition, expropriation of land or improvements. So if council considers that the closure could reasonably be expected to harm the interest of the municipality of the community charter. So there we go. We're moving. Andy moves it. And Janice seconds. And we're out.